Uh, Günaydın. Uh, good morning for everybody in the West Coast. Good afternoon for everyone in the East Coast of the United States. Uh, Günaydın. And uh, good, good morning evening morning for everybody, everybody in Europe and Turkey. Good afternoon for everyone in the East Coast of the United States. Um, welcome. Welcome to the second of our Turkey Now panels. Uh, this is a panel organized by the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. Uh, usually we have our monthly panels called WhatsApps, uh, where we discuss recent work. Uh, but today, uh, what we have is a, a panel that concentrates on uh, what is going on in Turkey these days. We had our very first one of these uh, a while ago on the Boazici University, what was going on over there. Uh, this time around, uh, we will be talking about what has happened at the Turkish parliament uh, recently and what is happening to the HDP. Uh, while there are so many experts here, I'm not going to uh, make any much more than a very simple introduction. We will start with Dr. Kishyar Ösoy, who is actually a member of parliament uh, from the HDP. Um, and he will not make a whole lot of political commentary today. Uh, he will stick, we, we gave him a sort of, we commissioned him to provide us with a summary of, of uh, a brief summary of what happened uh, in Turkey since the summer of 2015 in terms of HDP. And he will give us a series of facts uh, that relate to that. And then we'll move on to our panelists. Um, I will keep a, an eye on the clock and my colleague, uh, Professor Carol Woodall, who is uh, the Chief Administrative Officer of Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association, will be introducing our speakers in the first hour. And in the second hour, we will move on with a question and answer session. Carol, please go ahead. Good morning and good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, our first speaker, Dr. Hishyar Osoy, serves as HDP's co-spokesperson for foreign affairs and is a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe the Interparliamentary Union and the NATO Parliamentary Assembly and the Parliamentary Assembly of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Currently, he is a Turkish Parliament Deputy of Diyarbakir since June 2018. Previously, he was an Assistant Professor of Cultural Anthropology at the University of Michigan Flint. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Carol, for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Baki, as well. Uh, uh, can I start now? Right? Okay, so we are going one after the other. Okay, thank you. So I have put together some written uh, notes, actually, because we have a time issue. That is why uh, I will be reading uh, some notes. Uh, and, and I'm sorry if it's going to be boring for... Uh, sorry if it's gonna be repetitive or boring for some of our colleagues who are well informed about the political context, I'm sorry, but when putting together these notes, I was kind of like guided by the idea that you know many people in the audience may not be familiar with the context. So I'm keeping it very simple in that sense. So Turkey, within the broader uh, political uh, transformation in the Middle East, which is often violent, Turkey is rapidly moving away from her already weak democracy due to authoritarian policies of President Erdogan and his allies, particularly with respect to the Kurdish issue, this uh, tendency, this authoritarianism has gained particular momentum since 2015, when the HDP entered the parliament by passing the 10% election bar and prevented uh, President Erdogan from gaining the parliamentary majority and forming a single party government. With the Turkish type presidential system established under emergency rule in 2017, President Erdogan has virtually monopolized all executive, legislative, and judicial powers. Currently, there is no separation of powers in Turkey. And please don't take this as a political statement. This is also a fact, I would say. The judiciary is under the control of the government. The parliament 
is mostly dysfunctional and the government has a massive media machine while the limited alternative media outlets and social media are under tremendous pressure and censorship. After terminating the short-lived peace process with the Kurdish movement in 2015, President Erdogan and his allies ha have been pursuing a highly uh, militaristic anti-Kurdish agenda to destroy Kurdish gains and representation in Turkey and abroad, reducing the Kurdish question to one of security and denying its ethno-political core, the government has been using the state's security apparatus, uh, militant judiciary, and the media to destroy Kurdish representation in the parliament, in local governments, as well as in the civil society, the media, and in the fields of uh, culture, language, and the arts. So now more like concrete facts. More than 17,000 administrators and members of the HDP have been taken into custody since 2015, and over 5,000 of these people are still behind bars. Dozens of HDP deputies have been arrested since November 2016. Some of them were released later with their cases pending, while many of them fled the country and became refugees in Europe. 13 former members of HDP deputies uh, are still in prison, including our co-chairs, Salatin uh, Demirtas and Figen Yüksekdağ. And very soon, Ömer Faruk Gergerlioğlu, who uh, was recently removed from his seat on March 17, he will also join those deputies in prison. Uh, and in addition to all of these, there are currently about 1,000 immunity files against 59 HDP deputies. The government is preparing to lift our immunities again, the current MPs, and make more arrests. And that is what we are expecting in the coming months. Between 2016, September 2016, and February 2018, under emergency rule, the government unlawfully removed the co-mayors of close to 100 uh, HDP run Kurdish municipalities and replaced them with appointed Turkish governors. 30, sorry, 93 Kurdish mayors who were elected in 2014 were jailed. The Turkish government continued with such policy of destroying Kurdish municipalities after the local elections in March 2019. And starting with the August of that year, 2019, the government has so far removed 48 of 59 Kurdish mayors. And the majority of these people, they went to prison, 36 of them, and 16 of them are still behind bars. Uh, in addition to these, uh, over 20 Kurdish mayors who were elected in 2014 and arrested in 2016, they are still in prison. The two uh, Kurdish mayors of Diyarbakir, the town that I represent, which is the unofficial capital of Kurds in Turkey, Selçuk Mızraklı, a physician, and Gülten Şanak, who was elected in 2014, both of them are in prison. So uh, to summarize, the, the Turkish government has been ruling over 150 Kurdish municipalities, which were won by the HDP, uh, by means of a trustee regime. The trustees are mainly governors appointed by Ankara, right? Not elected Kurdish mayors, but appointed Turkish governors which has rendered meaningless to have even local elections in Kurdish provinces. We think that this should be viewed like removing Kurdish mayors and replacing them with, um, with uh, Turkish governors. This is a clear case of internal colonialism and it is very historical. I mean, we are kind of, it's kind of a deja vu. It is the early uh, decades of the Turkish Republic when, uh, you know, appointed people were mainly, you know, ruling Kurdish provinces. In addition to such government repression on the parliament and the local governments, many Kurdish media outlets were banned, their properties confiscated, many journalists in prison. Plus in the fields of culture, language and arts, for example, Kurdider with over 30 branches and the Istanbul-based Kurdish Institute, they were all banned over 200 Kurdish cultural and language institutions, centers, and libraries were banned over the last five years. 
almost all Kurdish women's organizations and institutions, as well as their centers in Kurdish municipalities were banned. Uh, and uh, and many of them, many female activists were actually uh, in prison, sp including spokesperson of Kurdish women's movement. Uh, uh, plus, there is a lot of uh, environmental disruption in Kurdish countryside as well, because the war started and even, I would say, trees, birds and insects in the Kurdish region are not safe from state violence. And this is kind of a brief summary of what happened, like, since 2015, as if these violence and this repression is not enough. And while we were expecting the Turkish government to implement the decision of the European Court of Human Rights to release our co-chair, Mr. Salahattin Demirtas, that was the expectation. On March 17, a member of parliament, Amar Faru Gergerlioğlu from the HDP was removed from his seat. And the same day, a closure case was launched against the HDP uh, after repeated calls from elements within the government. The closure of political parties, especially Kurdish ones, is not historically exceptional. Up to now, the Constitutional Court has banned at least six Kurdish political parties, but each time the Kurds could manage to build more powerful political parties and movements. And I think that this time it will not be any different. But the, this closure case shows the fears and weakness of the current Turkish ruling bloc, we think, because in uh, local elections in 2019, the HDP fulfilled a kingmaker role by supporting opposition candidates, which cost President Erdogan almost every single major city in Western Turkey. And the fear is that uh, the HDP has around minimum like 11 to 12% of the national vote. And if the HDP is to repeat the strategy it uh, applied during the local elections in 2019, if we repeat the same strategy in the presidential elections, it's almost for sure that President Erdogan and his allies will lose power. And that is why uh, the kind of pressure so far on the HDP did not create the results that they were expecting. The HDP didn't get paralyzed. It, it, they, they couldn't render us dysfunctional somehow. So now through a closure case and before the presidential elections, they want to organizationally paralyze the HDP or totally eliminate it by you know, formally shutting down the party, cutting the financial aid that we get from the treasury and imposing political bans on close to 700 HDP administrators, including myself. I am wrapping up now. The HDP is a progressive political party established by the Kurdish movement and various minoritized peoples, women, the labor and ecology movements who came together around values of justice, equality, peace and freedom. We view the repression of the Kurds as a systemic problem of the nation state formation in Turkey. And we advocate for an integrated approach to the struggle for equality and freedom for all oppressed peoples in Turkey. So let me conclude by saying that, although there is a lot of pressure on the HDP and now we have the closure case, HDP is more than a few buildings and a formal political entity. We do represent a diverse political history and a very complex sociology of struggles for recognition, justice, and power. We have created a political platform, by we I mean the HDP has created a political platform to bring together many oppressed, excluded, and underrepresented peoples and groups in Turkey and Kurdistan. The Kurds, Alevi people, EZD people, Syrian people, Armenians, women, ecology movements, LGBT community. I mean, whoever feels excluded and underrepresented, we try to bring all of them together and then carry them from social, political, economic, and cultural margins to the center of the political establishment to put that very establishment into a crisis and hopefully to undo it. So that is the HDP's political project. So now, even if we as individuals and the HDP as a political entity, we may not be able to survive this ongoing crackdown disclosure case. I mean, HDP may be closed and I myself and my other friends individually, we may get arrested and go to prison and become like 
politically irrelevant. That may happen. But I assure you that the kind of historical struggles and political traditions upon which the HDP was established in the first place, they will remain key actors and factors in Turkish and Kurdish politics. I mean, HDP is not a shop that they can just close down and our customers are not going to anywhere. That is kind of a classical statement that we are making nowadays. Even if they close the HDP, definitely we will be able to develop some other instruments to articulate the demands and aspirations of our people. And as we get closer to the next elections, the presidential elections, we are expecting more and more aggressive attacks on the HDP and other democratic forces in the country. And so we are also preparing to fuel up to empower our struggle for recognition and power. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Osoy. Our next speaker, Dr. Nilay Ozok Gundawan, is Assistant Professor of Ottoman and Middle East History at Florida State University. Her research centers on the questions of modern state making, property regimes, and intercommunal conflict and coexistence in Ottoman Kurdistan. Her current manuscript, Venerable Friends of the Empire, Kurdish Nobility and the Ottoman State in the Long 19th Century provides a multi-actor socio-historical analysis of the transformation and eventual dissolution of the Kurdish principalities in the Ottoman Empire and modern Turkey. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, a few days ago, we lost uh, former HDP deputy and Kurdish scholar uh, Kadri Yildirim Mamoste Kadri, and I would like to express my deepest condolences to his family and to the entire Kurdish society, I mean, Kurdish people. Um, I'm an historian who actively thinks and writes about the relationship between historical discourses and uh, historical narratives and political discourses. And I would like to take up from the last point that Dr. Rossoy actually made uh, when you close the shop, is it the end of Kurdish politics? And I would like to talk a little bit more about how should we approach Kurdish history from the perspective of uh, political uh, activi activism and political agency as opposed to uh, Kurdish uh, only oppression or victimhood. Because for so long, we talked about uh, Kurdish political history um, from the perspective of like they we situated them on the receiving end of politics. And um, on this, the state of statelessness actually had a big impact since Kurds didn't have a state in the age of the nation state. We restricted our analysis to political oppression and uh, repression across decades. And these representations, I argue, feed into a historical narrative that pushed Kurds outside of politics or the political realm at large. We always talk about like Kurds as uh, reacting to or resisting to uh, political changes that is happening outside of their own world in a way that we kind of underemphasize their political agency. So HDP is but just one of the many examples of complex political negotiations, alliances, strategies that Kurdish political groups used throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. And every significant episode of the modern history of the Middle East, Kurdish political elites, organizations, groups, associations, they came up with varying political agendas, politics, discourses, strategies, and they actively pursued negotiations with other actors around them. And it actually goes back to the very moment at which Kurdistan came under Ottoman control. Uh, Kurds came under Ottoman control in the 16th century within a very dire context, again, in the middle of an imperial rivalry between the Ottoman and the Safavid empires. And Selim, Sultan Selim I, he dispatched his um, representative, Idris Bitlisi, he was also a Kurd, if to negotiate with the Kurdish elites, Kurdish principalities who ruled the area at the time. And even then, Kurds pursued a very proactive policy. On the one hand, they were negotiating with the Safavids. They were looking for options. They were trying to see what their options were. And uh, they were also negotiating with the Ottoman center. So rather than describing that moment, for example, as like the first division of Kurdistan, a story of loss or, you know, uh, the beginning of a linear story of oppression, I think we need to see that point as a moment of proactive politics. Kurds are negotiating with two imperial powers, 
two very strong gunpowder empires of the time. So I tend to emphasize Kurdish political agency as opposed to Kurdish um, victimhood, which is very tempting because we have witnessed a lot in the past century. So starting in the 1830s, uh, the Ottoman administration began to reconsider the terms of that original agreement. And when I say politics, I really mean it, because at that very moment, Kurds did something that really few of the other groups in the Ottoman Empire did. That received, they received the jury political uh, privileges, economic and fiscal privileges, which is really rarity in the Ottoman realm as a result of that politics. And in the 1830s, within the context of modern state making, things started to change. Ottomans started to take those privileges away. And then they uh, organized really large scale military operations against Kurdistan and Kurdish emirs, starting from the 1820s and lasting all the way through the 1850s. And uh, we again might be tempted to think that it was the end of Kurdish politics. It actually was not because Kurds, Take, for example, the example of Bedir Hanbe, who was exiled to Crete. And in Crete, he, he was appointed as the Kadı, Ottoman Kadı in this huge island. So uh, they really persevered. So this is a story of resilience, if you ask me, in different ways. Uh, not from a romanticized point of view, but Kurds were political actors. And the scope of their political activism can't be restricted to an, 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 an analysis of oppression and reaction. You know, we can't describe it just purely within that scope. And I can come up with many other examples to show the proactive politics that Kurdish elites pursues throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. One instance is the uh, after the dissolution of the Kurdish Emirates in the 1840s, we see this new phenomenon, new phenomenon of the rise of tribal sheikhs as the new political leaders of the Kurds. And from historical, the established historical narratives, mainly under the influence of the you know, Turkish states, mainstream historical perspective, describe these groups as a apolitical. They are religious, they, are, they pursue traditional politics. But when we look at the example of Sheikh Ibaidullah, for example, in the 1880s, what we see is someone who is pursuing modern politics using modern strategies and instruments. He conveys his notion to uh, the British consul in Tabriz, for example, I'm quoting. He said, the Kurdish nation consisting of 50,000 families is a people apart. Their religion is different, and then their laws and customs are distinct, unquote. So what we see here is a proactive politics in a very uh, uh, critical point in the imperial history. And during the late century of the, uh, you know, very controversial Sultan of the 1870s and 80s, Sultan Abdul Hamid II, Kurds again uh, played different roles, varying roles, just like any other political actor. For instance, uh, they took significant positions in Kurdish bureaucracy. Kurd Said Pasha of the Baban Emirates served as Abdul Hamid II's foreign minister. Or another example, Abdul Razak Bey of the Bedir Han family, he served as the master of ceremonies at the imperial palace. But at the same time, they were uh, the members of the opposition organizing against Abdul Hamid. So I can give you as an historian very many episodes, examples of Kurdish politics outside of this linear story of uh, oppression or victimhood. And what I see is more of like perseverance and resilience. And then they, within the context of World War I, which is mostly described as a period of Kurds were betrayed. Okay, Kurds were betrayed, they were never given a state. Even in that context, when we change that historical narrative, what we see is like very proactive moves, negotiations and alliances that they perceive in that key moment in 20th century history of um, the Middle East. So in the question and answer, I might get into more details as to Kurdish proactive position, but I wanted to suggest a historical perspective and how that historical perspective feeds into our contemporary notions of Kurdish politics. And HDP is a coalition. It represents very many different groups, but Kurdish history consists of conscious political choices that political elites made throughout their history. They were not instruments, they were not victims, they were conscious political players in the complex scene of the Middle East politics. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lundwan, for providing that very rich and comprehensive historical background. Our next speaker, Dr. Sera Hakiemes, is an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Minnesota in Twin Cities. Her research concentrates on the anthropology of law and politics, with a special focus on the global war on terror, counterterrorism trials, sovereign violence, insurgency, and the Kurdish movement in Turkey. As an American Council of Learned Societies fellow, she was currently working on her book manuscript, The Law's Enemy, Terrorism Trials in Turkey's Kurdistan. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Carol, for this kind of um, introduction. And thank, thank you, Baikit Hezran, uh, for inviting me to this panel. Before I start my presentation, I want to note something. The trial of former Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin, uh, who is accused of murdering George Floyd, began today here in Minneapolis. And I want to express my feeling of solidarity with those seeking justice and fighting against anti-Black racism and police violence. We will see how the trial will proceed. Let me start with a brief description of how I arrived to the points I will make in this presentation about what I call the enemy law, Dushman Hukuku, that underwrites the HDP's closure case. I, conduct, I conducted ethnographic fieldwork in the special counterterrorism course of the Arbaker between 2008 and 2014 with some intervals. I observed some popular counterterrorism cases covered by national media outlets, such as KJK Anadaba, and not so popular ones attended only by family members of the accused. Defense lawyers who were tenured in these cases were puzzled by my several years long research in the Diyarbakir courthouse, where the same theater was staged by the Turkish judiciary day after day. What was I looking for? Why couldn't I yet find it? Some defendants ridiculed my insistence to observe their trials from nine in the morning to five in the evening, studiously taking notes of what judges, defendants, and their lawyers uttered. Unless there was a courtroom protest, they told, there was not much to note down. However, like the main character in Kafka's Before the Law story, who tries to access the inaccessible heart of the law beyond the, in beyond the infinite series of doors, I was waiting for the structure of the law to reveal itself to me to no avail. Not because there was not no structure, but rather because the, structu the structure of that law was not to be found in, the, in its letter. One day, I observed the trial of a young man who was a guerrilla fighter and apprehended by Turkish soldiers during the 2013 and 14 peace process. His family was nervous about the judgment the court would pass on that final day of his trial. When this man in his 20s which was charged with life in prison, an elderly man in the family asserted that the law that governs counterterrorism trials was called neither counterterrorism law nor criminal law. It was called the enemy law, with which it was impossible to make peace. The enemy law is more than the sum total of legal codes and criminal procedures that are allegedly used in observing counterterrorism trials. The enemy law, I argue, derives its legitimacy not from the rule of law, but from the rule of war. What makes the chief public prosecutor of Istanbul to file a lawsuit against the HDP possible, I argue, is the perpetuation of this enemy law. Given the accusation that the HDP has organic connections with the outlawed Kurdistan Workers' Party, with which the Turkish state has been in war since late 1970s. In his seminal work, Mesut Yen defines Kurd citizenship status as potential citizens, who are unable to entertain the equality principle before the law pertinent to liberal democracies. And we can discuss later if Turkey is nominally speaking still a liberal democracy. Their citizenship status is contingent upon their becoming of Turks. Via political interventions in Kurdistan attest that the Turkish state considers this racial transformation as a potential that is in the making, but not yet fully actualized. Not yet. Uh, 
The promise of equality before the law is therefore constantly deferred to a time yet to come. What kind of law then governs the relationship between Kurds and, inversely speaking, their potential state? If Kurds are not yet full citizens, what sub subject position are they given in the world of symbols, in the system of signifiers that is called the law? In semiotics and psychoanalytic theory, all signifiers are in some sense equivalent. If we just play on the difference of each from all the others through not being the other signifiers, i.e. Kurt as a signifier is the one that is Turkey as a signifier. But for the same reason, and I'm citing Jacques Lacan here, each signifier is able to come to the position of master signifier precisely because its potential function is to represent the subject for another signifier. Master signifier is that which represents the subject in a very particular way. The structure of representation is such that the subject is considered identical with his own signifier. What can be a better example of master signifier than the constitutional definition of Turkish citizenship in Article 16? And I quote, everyone bound to the Turkish state through the bond of citizenship is a Turk. In this article, the citizen subject is represented, undoubtedly, but also it is not represented. Something remains hidden in the citizen subject's relation to the master signifier, that is, the figure of the master finds its truth in the work of the other, the other that Lacan would call via Hegel the slave. The indispensable role that the work of the slave plays in the constitution of the figure of the master could not possibly be better articulated by anyone other than the Turkish jurist, academic, and politician Mahmoud Esat, Esat Bozkurt, who served as the Minister of Justice of the Turkish Republic in the third fourth and fifth governments between 1924 and 1930. In his speech on September 18, 1930 in Udemish, he said, my opinion, my conviction is that this country is a Turkish country. Those who are not real or pure Turk have only one right in this homeland, in this Turkish homeland, that is the right to be servant, the right to be slave, end quote. I want to remind the audience that Mahmoud Esad Bozkurt, the Turkish jurist educated in Switzerland, is known as the progenitor of the Turkish Civil Code and the Turkish Penal Code. Although he was removed from duty shortly after the speech, the speech itself illustrates vividly the hidden relation between the citizen subject and the master, master signifier. If the one who fails to identify with the master signifier is condemned to the subject position of slave, those who refuse to surrender to the chains of slavery would then be treated as the enemy, to whom, I argue, a special set of rules applies. It is this set of rules that the elderly man whose relative was sentenced to life in prison called the enemy law on that day. The enemy is, is assumed in the phantasmatic image of the terrorist, in the symbolic order of the law. In the name of fighting this enemy, a special juridical regime is inaugurated that operates through special police forces, special military operations, special courts, special high security prisons, and, a, and even a special state that is called the deep state. Is this special regime a regime of lawlessness and a regime of anti-law? My answer is yes and no. If we identify law with what is written in the books, one can find numerous examples to speak for the violation of the rule of law in the hands of special judges and prosecutors. In fact, some of the defense statements of former members of the parliament from HDP testify to the kind of violations folded into their cases. Yet, I'm afraid that law is irreducible to its letter given that it needs the support of unwritten rules through which it sustains its manifest content. These unwritten rules of the law originate in the war between the Turkish state and the Kurdistan Workers' Party. It is the waxing and waning intensity of this war that determines what judgment would pass in the course of law. What seems as an absurd theater of law is therefore not devoid of a structure. 
But in order to unpack its structure, one has to turn from the books of the law to the texture of the war. It is in the light of this war that one can understand that what appears at the outset, the lawlessness of the state, as the law of the war. This special regime weaponizes legal codes and procedures to collect total information on the Kurdish population, detect and detain Kurdish combatants and civilians, and create an, an atmosphere of fear and terror. Therefore, neither terrorism trials nor the closure case against the HTP can be comprehended through a legalistic an analysis that engages in a formalist reading of legal codes. Rather than, in, in, rather than an internal autonomous field of power, this special judicial regime appropriates and reproduces the tactics of counterinsurgency warfare. And what we are witnessing today is just another operation against what the Turkish consider, what the Turkish state considers as its enemy through the course of law. Perhaps we can discuss what new enemies are added to the list. Is the AKP government combined the state's special colonial rule in Kurdistan with a populist authoritarianism in the rest of the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hakimes, for your framing around this idea of the enemy law. Now we're going on to our next speaker. Dr. Mujahid Biliji is Associate Professor of Sociology at John Jay College and the CUNY Graduate Center. He is the author of Finding Mecca in America, How Islam is Becoming an American Religion, and Kurd the Porter, Turkish Islam and the Kurdish Question. Dr. Biliji was a regular columnist for Turkish dailies Taraf, Yen Yuzil, and more recently Duvar. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Baki and Carol, for bringing us together for this panel discussion. Uh, perhaps I should uh, also, uh, uh, it's a moment, uh, it's a good time to take a moment of remembrance of. Uh, late uh, Kadri Yildirim for his contributions to Kurdish studies and to Kurdish politics. Um, I should uh, begin uh, with a simple question. How is it that the third largest party can be treated like this? Uh, as it was uh, presented by previous uh, speakers, especially our colleague Shiar Ösö. Uh, the answer should be sought in the overall failure of Turkish opposition to take vital risks. The opposition in general and HDP in particular have continued to play the game according to the terms set by Erdogan and failed to withdraw from a national assembly that is no longer relevant. Let me take a quick note, make a quick note on Erdogan uh, uh, before I move on to HDP. Erdogan is a master politician who practices pure politics beyond any ideology or morality. His recent intervention at Boazici is not merely another move in Turkey's culture war. It's an instrumentalization of that culture war. It is important to remember the level of game the authoritarian regime is playing as we begin to think about HDP's role in opposition. There are two facts about HDP. First, HDP is the victim of a repression that is both structural and persistent. And second, HDP suffers from self-inflicted paralysis. I want to briefly highlight some of the problematic aspects of HDP. While my criticism is severe, it is kindly intended. HDP is suffering from a fetishization of resistance, a point uh, approximated uh, by Nilay in her presentation. It almost takes pleasure at being victimized, the party, almost takes pleasure at being victimized, being oppressed. Being the victim looks good on paper. It is almost post-structuralist cool, academically aesthetic, observer pleasing, idealized cliche feeding, but it does no good for the country. 
HDP as a party is not pragmatic. It is invested, invested in self-righteousness, a misguided self-celebration, and impractical idealism. That is why it is the most resistant, but at the same time also the least effective party in Turkish politics. Much smaller parties are treated with respect even for the smaller power they hold, but the respect HDP receives not from the party in power, but from its fellow opposition parties is tiny and given out of pity. HDP is whiny and dependent on others. The party's policies are always vague. Typically, there are no practical demands. Always splendid generic virtues that are not even practiced by the party, but constantly propagated and sloganized. You might think HDP is an idealistic party that is too principled to be pragmatic. Unfortunately, that's not the case. The principles it parrots at every level are far from being practiced. It is not, an demo, not a democratic institution. All of its officers are appointees, not unlike trustees appointed by the government, authoritarian regime. And they are chosen by a central, perhaps underground uh, Politburo. It is not autonomous and democratic enough to openly criticize the unjustified violence perpetrated by the PKK. And that's why it is treated less than even organized crime, uh, despite its size as a political party, despite its legitimacy and so on and so forth. Instead of actually doing politics, HDP politicians comment on politics, they fashion beautiful critics of the party or the authoritarian leader in power. They are at best activists, not politicians. I can tell from, ex from experience that criticisms of the party are not taken well. In the absence of real intellectual responses, they tend to draw on the tropes of serving the cause, martyrdom, etc., to respond to criticisms. Militaristic justification for the suppression of dissent and criticism, unfortunately, is part of HDP culture as well. In short, HDP acts not as a political party, but as an activist group at best, and a progressive student club at worst. You might ask, if all that is true, how do they get all those votes? Well, they have a captive audience a hegemonic and almost coercive grip on Kurdish politics. The policies of the party are partly independent of the demands of the Kurdish people and vice versa. For example, in recent years, it has been hard to find any Kurd who is fully satisfied with HDP, but they reluctantly vote for it as a vote against the dictatorial policies of Turkish regime parties. It is no coincidence that uh, Shiar's speech, for example, uh, is replete with notions of undoing the center, causing trouble, blocking Erdogan. It's all about negation. There is no construction. There is no uh, politics for the sake of power, doing power, exercising power, but blocking it. So it's all negatively constructed. It's all about resistance. And that fetishism, I think, is what paralyzes uh, uh, HDP as a party, regardless of its Kurdish origins or its ties to Kurdish needs, regardless of that, that's what paralyzes this party most. I'm going to stop here and I, uh, I'm looking forward to further conversation in the q and Thank you. Thank you very much for that statement, Dr. Biliji. Our next speaker, Dr. Bilgin Ayata, is Professor for Southeastern European Studies at the University of Graz in Austria. Her main research areas are migration, conflict, and citizenship. She has published widely on issues relating to Kurds and Kurdistan, as well as Turkey and the EU. She is the co-chair of the Research Association Switzerland, Turkey, and member of the Collaborative Research Center, Effective Societies at the Freie University of Berlin, 
Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much <clears throat> uh, for inviting and thank you very much, Carol and uh, Baki, to putting this panel together, uh, which uh, takes um, its uh, motivation from the political urgency that uh, Dr. Shia Ersoy has pointed out. I also wanted to express my thank you to uh, Dr. Ersoy that I can imagine, in, especially in these pol political extremely hard times, that it must be um, really hard to even uh, share with us your time to um, uh, tell us uh, what is going on. Thank you uh, also for th uh, that. Uh, in my remarks, I want to speak maybe uh, very briefly. Um, I want to make actually three three statements, um, three interventions. One actually maybe even ties with uh, what uh, my predecessor was just um, criticizing. Um, if I understand Mujahid uh, Bilic correctly, uh, the HDP are just activists, not a really political party. So um, I would like to begin my intervention by first um, maybe addressing the racial state uh, in Turkey and the racial contract, which has not only for the HDP, but overall presented a hardly, I mean, or a very defunct political system. And um, the beginning maybe with the um, um, uh, going back also briefly to history, I think it is really important to understand uh, what the racial contract in Turkey actually consists of and what kind of political opportunities uh, and are even out there. So um, the original sin, so to say, of the Republic, uh, first of all, um, is the Armenian genocide, that, which has not been addressed. And I want to highlight uh, and address that. So uh, before the Republic, the elimination of the non Muslims was then continued after the founding of the Republic with uh, the new internal enemy of the non-Turkish population. So uh, in fact, the political infringements that we're seeing currently on the HDP has a continuity as is in part and parcel of politics in Turkey. At some point, the name is HDP. Earlier, it was a different name, but there is a repetitive pattern here that is uh, that rests on a racial contract in which similar like the discussions that we saw also in the US uh, inspired by, by the Black Lives uh, Matter movement on <clears throat> uh, the normalization of white supremacy. And um, in Turkey, this has resulted in the exclusion of uh, all those who were deemed not to be Turkish or not Turkish enough. Now, um, from this racial contract, which different scholars have been writing about, just of course important to mention Barış Ünlü, who wrote this as a Turk contract of Turkishness, and uh, but also um, others have been pointing out to that. I would like to tie in the issue of racism, maybe depart for a little bit the sphere of Turkey and uh, also um, a look at Europe, uh, which in this moment and in these times play also a very important role in their, not, in their silence towards the political developments that we uh, are seeing and which uh, Dr. Erso has been pointing out. Uh, um, so um, maybe the counterpart of uh, racism in Turkey currently plays out in, Tur uh, in the European uh, political context vis-a-vis um, -vis refugees and um, the prevention of more migration from Asia and Africa to Europe. And this has, um, through um, the various policies that have been uh, implemented in the past years, led uh, directly, had a negative effect on the domestic politics in Turkey. Um, uh, Dr. Ersoy was pointing out that the chair of the HDP was arrested uh, on 17th of March. Uh, well, that was exactly the, five, the fifth year anniversary of the so-called Turkey EU deal. Uh, this is a, 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 an agreement between the European Union and Turkey that was uh, reached between, uh, on the 17th and 18th of March in 2015, 2016 um, that entailed uh, uh, 6 billion uh, euros of financial assistance um, 
in order uh, for Turkey to help control the coasts uh, stronger so that more migration would be prevented. Now, what has that to do with the HDP? What we are seeing is that even though already for several years already, um, uh, the EU had all taken a different course in uh, their um, uh, uh, support for um, or in their official discourse in promoting uh, democratic forces in Turkey, uh, especially with this uh, agreement uh, uh, that rests on the exclusion of uh, refugees coming to uh, Europe, the further deterioration of um, politics in Turkey, democratic politics has been quite visible. And I believe it is really important to make also the connection uh, with this uh, tacit support of the EU uh, towards the current uh, politics uh, of the Turkish government, uh, both against the Kurds in, at large, but also that I want to also invoke that uh, Within the same time, uh, Turkey also withdrew from the Istanbul Convention uh, Treaty, uh, human, human Rights Treaty that um, has been um, uh, uh, pushed forward to combat violence and uh, against women. And Turkey just declared exactly at the same time as it was uh, threatening to close down the HDP, uh, its signature from this treatment. So I believe that this, uh, to look at this in conjunction is also quite important. <clears throat> the, um, uh, such a perspective, I would really urge very much to also bring in these different layers that are currently uh, uh, coalescing in the rapid and further, further deterioration and uh, uh, place and frame this very much within uh, uh, reading that looks both at racism and sexism together. Uh, Dr. Ersoy was pointing out um, uh, how a woman and uh, members of the LGBTQI communities have found a very important place um, also within the HDP and um, the criticisms uh, that uh, were just raised before with regard to activism may be just a very uh, result and outcome of this very uh, limits of a racial state. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ayata, for providing that perspective on this complicated issue. Our next speaker, Dr. Dilek Kurban, is a socio-legal scholar specialized in human rights. Currently, she is a fellow and lecturer at the Herzi School in Berlin. She has been awarded the Max Weber Postdoctoral Fellowship at the European, European University Institute for the year 2021-2022. Her monograph, Limits of Supranational Justice, the European Court of Human Rights and Turkey's Kurdish Conflict was published in 2020 by Cambridge University Press. Thank you very much for your participation. Um, thank you, Carol, for this introduction and Baki uh, for the invitation. And um, it's, um, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be a part of um, such an important and timely event and thank you. And hello to everybody, to old colleagues. I have a PowerPoint presentation. It just makes it very easier, much easier for me to stick to time frame, you know, to time limit and to organize my thoughts. And I hope also that it would make it easier for you all to follow me. I suppose you can see it, right? Okay. Um, All right, okay, so, um, so what I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to um, limit my um, presentation to, you, you know, my focus is, is the European Court of Human Rights, and I'm going to uh, limit my presentation to the court's involvement in Kurdish political representation only. Um, in my book, um, I look at the court's entire jurisprudence um, on the Kurdish conflict, predominantly on state violence, gross human rights violations, um, and secondarily on Kurdish political rights, but also linguistic rights. But I'm not going to get into linguistic rights or um, state violence in the presentation today. 
So just by way of a very brief um, uh, 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 historical, let's say, reminder, of course, the repression of Kurdish nonviolent um, opposition in Turkey dates back to 1950s. Um, it is not new. And I'm talking about um, nonviolent democratic opposition, political um, opposition. Um, and, um, you know, we have examples of um, criminal cases, court cases um, uh, against um, Kurdish uh, magazines and um, authors um, who were um, put on trial just because they published um, and written uh, and wrote in Kurdish, um, banning of various cultural organizations, etc. But my focus really is a very brief overview um, since the European Court of Human Rights or the ECHR has entered into the picture in Turkey. And how did that happen? In 1987, Turkey recognized the right of individual petition to the then European Commission on Human Rights. Um, and in 1990, Turkey recognized um, the ECHR's compulsory jurisdiction. The reason for both of these um, was to gain um, candidacy uh, status with the EU. Um, it was not driven by um, human rights or um, uh, human rights considerations. So, um, and then just a bit of background on um, the judicial repression of Kurdish political rights and nonviolent mobilization in Turkey. It, of course, it, it has not started with the AKP, we know that. Um, uh, there is a history for decades. Um, and this really goes back to um, um, the 90s. Again, I'm talking about the post-ECHR era here. So what do we have? Political party closures, right? The Turkish Constitutional Court closed down every single Kurdish political party um, the first of which was established in 1990, DEP. Uh, since 1993, the court dissolved five political parties in total. The sixth one, DEHAP, dissolved itself in order to escape dissolution. There's an important distinction to be made um, within the Turkish Constitutional Court's jurisprudence on political parties. There is a difference between the first three, OZDEP, DEP, HEP, and HADEP, and then the last two, HADEP and DTP. In that, HADEP and um, the, um, the latter, the European Court of Human, sorry, the Turkish Constitutional Court closed down HADEP and DTP after the ECHR had issued its rulings on the first three finding violations, right? And also HADEP and DTP were closed down, they were dissolved after 2001 constitutional reforms, which actually had raised the constitutional threat threshold on political party dissolutions. So constitutionally, legally, de jure, it had become much more difficult um, on theory uh, to close political parties. The, the Turkish Constitutional Court had to show that the party in question had become center of illegal activities. And yet, HADEP and DTP were closed down. So this shows that the European Court of Human Rights and the EU accession process had no impact on the Turkish Constitutional Court's jurisprudence on um, political party dissolutions. Um, and these dissolutions were always um, accompanied with um, ancillary measures, such as the liquidation of political parties, the confiscation of their assets, political bans um, on senior political leaders. Um, they face five-year ban on joining another party. For example, 46 members of HADEP um, um, had faced political bans, but of course, as uh, Dr. Osoy um, told us in his introduction, here the Turkish judiciary really upped the ante by um, asking the prosecutor asking uh, for um, political bans on around 700 HDP members. So we see that actually this time, I mean, there's of course continuity, but there's also something really uh, much more drastic uh, that they're that at least the prosecutor is trying to do. We will see whether the Turkish Constitutional Court will follow up on that. Um, and also parliamentarians were stripped of their parliamentary immunities, they were expelled from the parliament and sentenced to imprisonment. In the case of um, DEP, um, uh, they were sentenced to, DEP deputies were sentenced to 15 years imprisonment and actually some served up to 10 years. Um, then let's talk about, let's come to the um, uh, H AKP era. Now here, there was, con there, there is continuity as we see, um, there's now an HDP, there's a dissolution case that's brought against HDP. Uh, Dr. Osoy spoke about other examples. But what we see now is actually a multifaceted and more um, comprehensive disenfranchisement strategy. At the local level, for example, in 2007, um, and this was done by the Minister of Interior, the Minister of Interior opened a court case 
for the dismissal and dissolution of the mayor and municipal council of the Sur district of Diyarbakir only because they made the democratically taken decision to provide Kurdish municipal services in Kurdish in addition to Turkish, right? Turkish would remain as the official language in, you know, but um, because based on a needs assessment survey, which so showed that 72% of the residents in Sur spoke Kurdish in their daily lives, municipality had decided to provide um, municipal services in Kurdish. Um, and not only the mayor was the elected mayor dismissed and the elected municipal um, council dissolved, um, AKP, uh, replaced the mayor with an appointed bureaucrat who remained in that office for two years, although there was a clear legal requirement that new elections had to be held in six months. Then, of course, we have the KJK case. Um, it was mentioned earlier, and this it's important that this the the first arrest arrest the initial arrest of 53 individuals, including mayors, happened only two weeks after the municipal elections in 2009, where DTP swept the Kurdish region. And then the number of detainees um, reached to, um, reached to uh, thousands uh, very quickly. And then of course, at the national level, um, in Ju July 2007 elections, after 13 years of ab absence, the movement, the Kurdish national movement returned to the parliament with DTP, this time through independent candidates. And a couple of months later, already, the DTP faced the closure case, and in 2009, it was dissolved. So now, um, how did the ECHR respond to this picture? Um, again, this, is, this is, will be um, sort of a selective um, presentation. Now, on political party resolutions, dissolutions, in every case that reached this, uh, to Strasbourg, the ECHR's ruling was favorable, favorable for the applicants. In all of the cases, it found article, a violation of Article 11, freedom of association, plus, in DTP, very importantly, the court found violation of Article 3 of Protocol 1, which concerns the right to free elections, because the court said that the stripping uh, the TTP co-chairs, the stripping TTP co-chairs of their parliamentary seats and also instituting political bans on leaders, senior leaders of the party, violated their uh, the co-chairs right to be elected and the DTP electorate's sovereign power. The court also dismissed Turkey's counterterrorism argument. It said the criticism of counterterrorism is not sufficient to equate um, uh, the DTP with the PKK. And there's something really important here in terms of those who are familiar with the discussion that's going on uh, in Turkey, at least in the social media from what I see, that the prosecutor um, uh, re referred to the ECHR, uh, to the Batasuna judgment, in uh, asking for HDP to be uh, dissolved. And you know th this is mentioned with irony oh, well, now the, um, the Turkish government is uh, remembering uh, the ECHR. But, I th but the HDP really needs to hold on to that um, uh, analogy because that's really important because the, the ECHR has already dismissed the Batasuna analogy in the DTP judgment. There, the ECHR said, um, you know, the DTP's party program condemned violence, put forth democratic solutions, party le leaders advocate peace, they call on PKK to dis disarm, and um, just because DTP pursues similar goals with PKK doesn't mean it justifies the use of force. It also emphasized the political context, DTP's mediatory role to bring an um, end to violence, all of which, of course, is also applicable for the HDP. But Jan, uh, I'm very sorry to intervene. Mm -hmm. I just worry because you're at number seven and you have under yeah. number 13 and you already ran out of time. OK, it's going to take very long and I'm hoping we could give a, have a little second round of chance for people to respond to each other and then take questions. I okay. would really appreciate it if you could wrap it up quickly. I know okay. the content is invaluable. I'm sure the audience is interested, but it would be unfair uh, to other members of the panel. I'm very sorry to have intervened. No, no, you're absolutely right. I, I actually have 11. Um, 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 the, the rest too. Okay, just maybe just two words. So those are the positive sides, right? But, and I can, I'd be happy to come back to that. Other questions that were raised before the ECHR were, for example, the national electoral threshold. And in this judgment, and this is also a grand chamber judgment, there the ECHR actually ruled in favor of Turkey. And I'd be very happy to share, you know, discuss this if there's um, a, a question that is raised. Also, I mentioned the Sur municipality case. That case also was before, brought before the ECHR. And in that case, the ECHR did not even issue a judgment. It dismissed the case, found it inadmissible. 
which and these two are very problematic judgments. Then, of course, we have recently the Mirtash um, judgment, uh, which was favorable. It's a grand chamber judgment, very important. But I think one thing that I would like to bring to your attention, because the audience here may not know this, but only one month before the Demirtash judgment, ECHR actually dismissed HTP's application um, on the basis that, you know, HTP basically argued that, you know, by the uh, stripping by the expulsion of my um, MPs, deputies, and their arrests, my rights are also violated, and the ECHR dismissed the case. So just by way of conclusion, what we see in the ECHR response over the years um, uh, in, in, in these cases, it's, it's a really depoliticized and non-contextual legal analysis. It rigidly applies the standing rules. Um, it does not, it, it is either failure it cannot or does not want to address the structural and multifaceted disenfranchisement strategy against the Kurds. Um, and at the root of all of this is, I argue, um, the ECHR's perception of Turkey as a liberal democracy, where in essence it has always been and continues to be an authoritarian regime and should be uh, treated as such. I do apologize from everyone for having exceeded the time limit. Thank you very much, Dr. Kurban, and I do hope that we have plenty of time for you to elaborate on your research moving forward. So our very last speaker is Dr. Gunesh Murat Tezjur. He is the Jalal Talabani Chair and Professor at the School of Politics, Security, and International Affairs at the University of Central Florida. He is also the Founding Director of Kurdish Political Studies Program at the University of Central Florida. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks so much, Carol. And I would like to thank also Baki Tezjan. I mean, I have been a member of the OSA maybe for the last three or four months, and I can tell that he brought a much needed energy to the association. I mean, just thanks to Baki and the other members of the leadership team for basically organizing this event and many other events in the last couple of months, uh, especially during these uh, troubled times. Uh, I mean, being the last speaker has its own advantages and disadvantages. Um, so I will basically make three points. I will basically start with a very pessimistic understanding of the Kurdish question in Turkey and its implications for democratic struggles in the country. But then I will basically try to end in a more positive note, uh, try to basically identify a similar lining uh, as we have been doing maybe uh, very often in the last five years. So my question is basically is, what are the implications of the HTP's closure for democratic struggles in Turkey? Uh, I have to say that if you look from a broader comparative political science perspective, the Kurdish question, I think all of our speakers will agree with this assessment, remains the most salient issue for the sustainable democratic process in the country. But at the same time, when you look at all the different factors which were associated with the Kurdish question, it also presents a very gloomy picture. And what I mean is that, and I completely with, agree with Hishyar, he basically described this practice as uh, internal colonial, colonialism. I will basically call it more like neocolonialism in the sense that you have a system in which I will say the like, Kurdish citizens of the country are completely deprived from their right to elect people in public offices, but also deprived to kind of really vote and then in a meaningful sense. And that has been the, the typical practice in the last five years since 2015. And I mean, I also agree with him when he basically makes some analogies with the early Republican periods. I will say that that was actually the case uh, be before 1950. But other than that, if you basically from a broader perspective, what you can see is that in general, the Kurdish life, and always not in Turkey, but also in other Middle Eastern countries, has been characterized by a high element of precarity, to borrow a term from Judith Butler. I mean, obviously, we can all give many different examples. Uh, you can basically think that Turkey has a huge history of violence, mostly by the state, but also sometimes by the non-state uh, actors. I mean, there's only one case when the Turkish state used chemical gases, which was in uh, Dersim in 1938. There's basically all these recent documents in the last couple of years, which basically show that that is actually the case. But if you look at basically the practices which become very prevalent and dominant in the Kurdish regions, especially in 19, post-1980 period, you can talk about a cultural impunity, which was obviously very intense during the 1990s with lots of thousands of extrajudicial uh, executions, but also in more recent years, in the last five years. I mean, in a sense, every month you can talk about many different practices, which clearly show that if you end up being a Kurdish citizen in this country, you basically have uh, much less value in your life compared to other citizens in the country. But then I basically want to say one more thing, and this is going to be more pessimistic because at least from my perspective as a social scientist, 
it is not only about the state. It's not only about the state violence or state practices, which basically perpetuate that kind of a uh, system. And I mean, there are many other scholars who study this issue, and I always benefit from the, their uh, wisdom. And I have to say that it is also about more at the social level. I mean, you can make a strong argument. Uh, I mean, Mujahid Basic wrote a book a couple of years ago, the Hamal Kurt uh, in Turkish, and then many other like the scholars basically did empirical studies, which basically show that there's a huge social distance between the ethnic Turks broadly defined and then the rest of the country, which basically means that, that it becomes very difficult for any political party which basically try to make a cross ethnic appeal to kind of really come up with very courageous and very maybe progressive platforms regarding the Kurdish question. Because I mean, again, if you think about that, the current party, which became very authoritarian, especially in maybe since 2013, was also perceived as the most reformist party uh, during the entire Turkish Republic. I mean, if you think about the AKP's so-called uh, opponent uh, from maybe 2008 up until 2015, but then, I mean, if you look at the opposition parties, then you can also make the argument that their position on the Kurdish question are not very different. I mean, can you basically make a big difference between the MHP and the E party when it comes to Kurdish question? You just basically replace the actors, one becoming the opposition, the other being in the government. And then probably you are going to have this see similar policies which are going to be advocated by the E party if it ends up being the government. And then obviously, JP is another question, and there's lots of internal struggles taking place in the country, in the party. But from a broader perspective, I think we have to acknowledge that it is not only a question about the state repression, it is more about this ethnic differences, which obviously goes back to the extremely fragmentary and violent and incomplete nation building in pro process in Turkey, which make this question very difficult to resolve. And the other point is that um, it is not only about Turkey, because we always talk about transnational developments. I mean, there's obviously a Kurdish South rule in uh, northern Syria which also creates lots of uh, implications for any kind of Kurdish struggle in Turkey. So I mean, I'm just, I can basically go on, but then let me try to basically uh, complete with a more optimistic note, and this will be more, more like silver lining. So my point is that so far, the Kurdish question always been more like insulated from the rest of the population. I mean, you can find many other examples in many different kind of parts of the world. I mean, I am living in the American South, you can think about Jim Crow, but ultimately the question is that you can have a, relatively pluralistic and democratic system, even if a sizable minority in the country are being oppressed. And I think this has been the question in Turkey for a long time. But then, since the recent deepening of authoritarianism in the country, that it becomes clear that there's more like a link fate between the rest of the society and the Kurdish minority. Because then the question becomes, can you really achieve any kind of progress in Turkish democratization without appealing to the Kurdish question, without basically developing new policies towards the Kurdish question. And my response will be no, because at the moment, we have basically a very right-wing government. And for the government, Kurdish issue became like a wedge issue. In the past, I mean, it was different, but nowadays, from the, at least from the AKB's perspective, you want to kind of really melt the Kurdish issue because this is the only way you can keep your power. This is the only way you can fragment and ma manipulate the opposition, which basically means that as long as opposition is unable to de develop new strategies to overcome these ethnic differences, then they have no viable path to uh, achieving progressive change in the country. And maybe from this perspective, maybe for the first time in the entire Turkish history, you can talk about a situation in which there's a link fate between the large segments of the society, which basically make more rights, which basically ask for more freedom, and then the Kurdish minority. And then unless there's basically a more like a cross-ethnic coalition building, a sustainable one, and I think we basically solved the feasibility of that in Istanbul uh, two years ago in 2019. Is there a question how you can basically replicate the same success at the national level? It's an open question. But from this perspective, that basically became maybe the only optimistic route out of this current ordeal we basically find the country uh, uh, in, the last, in the last five years. Thank you. I would like to thank to all of our panelists. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you especially for trying to keep uh, to your allotted time. I really appreciate that. And then I need to issue a personal apology at the very beginning of the panel. While I did start the live stream, I missed the button saying start webinar. So the very first introductory sentences I uttered were lost to those of you who were in the webinar as participants, uh, as uh, you know, audience members. I actually had said a few uh, sentences about OTSA and, and passed uh, the, uh, the microphone to Carol, who introduced 
uh, Dr. Ursoy, and then I realized, oh my God, I missed that button. Anyway, so if you are wondering about the first few minutes, you can catch it on the YouTube recording. Now, we were originally planning to take questions and answers right after the first presentations, but uh, what we thought, Carol and I, uh, as the pre our presenters were uh, going with their brief presentations, uh, it might be perhaps a, a good idea to give a chance to everyone to respond or to comp uh, you know, complement each other's presentations, because there were some that passed the ball to each other, and then there were some that stood out as an alternative voice, and it might be a, a useful and interesting exercise to see whether people would like to respond very briefly, but I really mean it very, very briefly, because we do want to answer some of the questions we received. There are in the Q&A seven questions already, and uh, we will be sharing them uh, for you to respond as panelists in a little bit. Please, uh, let's go with the perhaps more or less the same order with uh, Dr. Ursoy going first and keep yourself to two minutes, two minutes only. Please, Dr. Ursoy, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, very informative, very brilliant presentations. Really, I benefited from each and every single one of them. Uh, and uh, and all, including those raised by Mujahid Hoja, they were very harsh, I would say, but as he said, kindly intended, although I think some of them were a bit unfair. But uh, let me just say a couple of things. My understanding of Mujahid Hoja's criticisms is kind of, his was a kind of critique of the kind of political culture that dominates the field that we call the HTP. And I would uh, like, him to also think about the fact that that political culture is not really Ishar Ossoy's choice or Salatin Demirtas or Idris Malutian for that reason. That political culture with, with its own limitations does also offer certain possibilities and, and that culture is historically produced. I mean, if we are talking about say, a culture of activism, a culture of resistance, whichever, you may want to pick, although when you do ethnographic research, activism it doesn't apply really that much to many Kurdish people. They distinguish between struggle and politics. In fact, I wrote a whole chapter about this, the Kurdish distinction between mujadala and siyaset, and many of them would say, eskiden her şey siyasetti, mücadeleydi, şimdi siyaset olmuş her şey. And by struggle, they kind of romanticize actually political struggle, the mountains, the prisons, and this and that, while they are highly critical of the notion of politics, siyaset, as the space of inaccessible bureaucracy, new Kurdish hierarchies with the you know rise of municipalities and other things. It is a very, very productive debate, I should say that, but 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 the very culture that is somehow limiting the HTP is also enabling us to survive under the direst political circumstances of repression. Just one thing, I can't take that one, Mijayat Hoja. I am so sorry. I swear there is nothing enjoyable about this repression here in Turkey. I swear. At least I personally don't enjoy it. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Ersoy. Thank you very much. Nilay, uh, uh, Dr. Özak, Özok Gündoğan, would you like to say a few things? Yeah, I don't know how it would be relevant because we are in the middle of an important discussion between Mujahid and uh, Shiar about HTP's role. But I would maybe just say one sentence about, as, from an historian's point of view, it's always possible to understand uh, oppression uh, while recognizing struggle and uh, resistance and perseverance. Uh, that's what I would like to emphasize. So maybe we can situate our criticisms uh, from an historical point of view and understanding the nuances within people's actions and political decisions and choices that they make within certain constraints. That I would, that's something that I would like to highlight maybe uh, with this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Nilay. Uh, and I think in the order after Nilay came Sarra. Am I remembering that right? Yes, please. Um. I think I had just a few observations after listening to the uh, the 
presentations of these wonderful panelists. And one is, um, of course, when I was listening to Mijait Bilije, I was thinking of all these anthropological works on resistance. And um, in the 1990s, all these anthropologists were writing about this Foucauldian turn where everyone was talking about resistance, like the power of the weak, like they were engaging with both historians and anthropologists to say that, hey, look, there's some romanticiz romanticization happening here. But I was just also thinking that, um, especially I'm, uh, you reminded me of Lila Abu Lugot's article, The Romance of Resistance, in which she says she takes resistance as a di diagnostic of power. And uh, when you were talking about HTP, I was wondering, okay, what are the conditions that is producing this kind of what Shia Rousseau said, cult cultural resistance? So what, what your analysis tells us about the power and the power structures within which this resistance is happening. And, um, and in my presentation, I was using the term the Kurdish movement. And I just want to clarify that when I say the Kurdish movement, I'm not only talking about HDP. I think the Kurdish movement is a network of organizations and HDP is only one actor within that network of relations. So what is happening in one org like what what is happening in the youth movement might not necessarily um, reflect the HDP's um, official discourse, but it doesn't mean that they do not shape each other. And I want to say one more thing about um, Bilgin's presentation. Um, I was I really. Um, I really found it very important that uh, we this panel combined the illegal, so-called illegal methods through which counterinsurgency warfare is waged in Turkey and how liberal democracy, democracies do actually support these illiberal methods. And I think um, the, um, it's important to emphasize that racialization of the enemy is always at the heart of this um, combination of liberal democracies with illiberal methods of counterinsurgency warfare. And I I want to thank Bilgin for emphasizing that part. And um, yeah, this, this, is, this is all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mujahid, please. Well, I would like to first uh, thank uh, Isha Rassoy for his uh, uh, compassionate uh, attitude towards my criticisms. Uh, thank you for kindly taking them. And uh, I, I fully understand that there are limitations and I think this should be part of the conversation, uh, whether what HDP is practicing is a kind of uh, uh, desperate policy in response to desperate uh, situation or whether it's a willful you know, uh, choice among options and so that that conversation should happen uh, at some point and uh, I, I I believe no one likes to be victim but I think certain um, kind of political uh, understanding seems to uh, push Kurds constantly towards this sense of victimhood and uh, and uh, some, some sense of uh, rejection of power on the part of the party is what bothers me most. Let me put it more simply. A political party that doesn't want power uh, is a paradoxical situation. And I think you can practice that power uh, nicely, uh, uh, justly, and so on and so forth. We, I don't see that in HDP. HDP seems to be acting constantly in terms of undoing the bad guys or whatever. So it's, it's a negational uh, effort as much as I can see. Uh, in terms of, um, so, so the problem is a res romantiza romanticization of resistance. Uh, and uh, of course, Kurdish history has uh, examples of, in various forms. You can see when Kurds were practicing power, not just a recipient of oppression and or justice and so on. What is lacking in, in Kurdish imagination, in my understanding Kurdish political imagination right now, is the notion of sovereignty. Uh, Kurds should see themselves as the owner of Turkey, as shareholder of the country. That understanding is lacking. Kurds are seeking rights, seeking uh, deliver, delivery of rights and so on. And that is, I think, what bothers me most. And perhaps my reaction are a little emotional, uh, but uh, I'm part of Kurdish society. Uh, and uh, so I, I sometimes express my uh, ideas a little harshly. What is my... Um, Solution to the problem, I think a more proactive policy, politics that is less academic, less uh, 
you know, check boxing, all those uh, diversity matters and so on. Not that they are less important. They are absolutely crucial and uh, I, I, I see their relevance. But practicing politics in Turkey is not something that happens on paper. So legalism and uh, uh, kind of definitional uh, understanding of politics versus practical, pragmatic realities on the ground are uh, two separate things. And that seems to be uh, not sufficiently addressed in policies of HDP. By the way, I got some compliment in the q and part. someone asking about my mental health. I'm doing well as far as I know, but I hope uh, other people also think I'm doing well. Thank you. Uh, Mujahid, thank you. We did not release the questions. Oh, you did. Okay. That they don't know that question. Oh, that's I good. was not planning to release that one. Oh. I think you're doing well. Too. All right, thank and, you. And there is clearly a differences of opinion. <laughs> and I don't know how true that prophetic hadith is, how authentic it is, but the prophet is supposed to have said it's a good thing to have differences of opinion among the community, right? So even if we go with uh, AKP, strong Islamic idealism in ordering society, it's a good thing to have differences of opinion and a little bit discussion among the members of the panelists. Thank you. Now, uh, I think the next should be Dilek, if I remember correctly, right? No, it wasn't Dilek. Uh, no. uh, I'm sorry, Bilgin, of course, of course, of course, Bilgin, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, see, I uh, thought the panel is on the judicial coup against the HDP that we are addressing from a variety of perspectives. That's how I understood it. I'm it's of course great to have many opinions, but I'm just a little confused. I have to say uh, about Mujahid, what uh, you're referring to um, when you're saying the Kurds do not want to have power. I mean, I think uh, we just heard before from uh, Shiar Özsoy how elected mayors elected office holders from Kurdish political parties from the HDP have been ousted of their positions and put into prison. That doesn't seem to be really like um, the situation about uh, um, giving up your position because uh, you fetishize being a victim. So what is the larger issue? I'm sure I understand that, you know, there are many important discussions that need to lead, that need to be led. And there are many uh, important uh, places also to do this. But I thought we we're gathering here today because once more, there is an institutional assault on evicting uh, Kurdish politics out of the public arena. Right, And uh, I tried in my contribution to also point out what kind of role the EU plays in. We didn't talk about the US, for instance, that would be also important. Uh, there is a war going on in the region, right? Other Kurds across uh, the border, right? In Syria, who also have trying to take on power and establish um, uh, an autonomy uh, have been facing military interventions by the Turkish state. So with all due respect, I thought that the task here at hand or the urgency that we're here talking about is to make sense how a systematic, ongoing, historical and contemporary uh, effort to erase a, you know, Kurdish various levels of determination. It can be you know, from self-determination to autonomy to the simple thing like participating in politics via elections in a party that you know, um, emerged out of the Kurdish movement, right? And I find this in the wider context when we talk about the Middle East or you know, in the wider region, this to be a really pressing phenomena um, especially also when we're speaking here in US academic context, uh, where we, there are many, many debates, for instance, also on Palestinian rights. And you know, in this, within this context, I mean, the mere fact how over and over again, Kurdish um, expression, Kurdish political participation is being systematically erased, quite a bit of a, a phenomenon that uh, I thought we 
come, that, that calls for our attention uh, in our discussion today. That is not to say that there is, should not be a criticism, but I'm really puzzled about Kurtz, the statement, Kurds do not want to have power, given how, what kind of punishments they receive whenever they attempt uh, to seek power. Thank you, Bilgin. And could I please now have Dilek for just a couple of minutes only? Oh, I'll pass since I exceeded my limits already. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Gunesh, would you like to say a, a few things? Uh, yes. I mean, I just want to join to this uh, discussion between uh, Mujahid and Hishyar. And um, I have to say that HTV actually goes against the ethos of the times. And what I mean is that you are basically trying to come up with a very comprehensive platform which try to represent many excluded and underrepresented groups as a, if I can basically say it very directly, as an ethnic minority party. But I mean, you can basically make the argument that there should be the primary task of a Turkish leftist party, and this, then you can basically work with the type party today. But the problem is that there's obviously a huge issue with the Turkish left, and you can also say that maybe Turkish left has been power for not more than two years since 1950, only in 1970s when the Egypt was actually a leftist uh, politician. I don't think that you can actually consider the DSP of Egypt in the late 1990s as a leftist party. But then the problem is that you basically try to basically achieve something despite the fact that you're actually a much kind of weaker force. But then coming back to the Mujahid's point, I mean, I actually agree with uh, some of his critical comments about the PKK HTP relationship. And I mean, from a structural point of view, then you basically try to pursue civilian politics. But then, I mean, as a matter of fact, you have armed struggle, which has a much longer history. And then for many different reasons, and many of them being sociological, it is a huge popularity among Kurdish people. And the question becomes, how are you going to basically establish your autonomy at the same time when you are facing lots of repression from the Turkish government? Well, I mean, think about the person who has the potential of being the real civilian Kurdish leader. He has been in prison since uh, November of 2016. I mean, in a sense that if you think about the Demirtas position, when he basically explicitly opposed the Erdogan's presidential system, he obviously paid the price. I mean, and you can make the counterfactual argument that he was in a position to really establish himself as a very popular civilian politician, if not that for, for, for this position. And then second point is that, I mean, Mujahid can make disagree with that and very actually very good friends, so I think it's okay uh, between friends. If you look from a Kurdian perspective, more like a Kurdish right, if I can say that, like self-sovereignty and self-determination, I mean, sure, you can basically think about the Kurdish party in Turkey, which primarily focused on the Kurdish rights and really kind of marginalized all other issues. I mean, this will be basically more kind of a Puritan nationalist party. And I think that is going to have some appeal among Kurdish people. But then how feasible is that? I mean, how basically feasible to pursue such kind of party, which is going to really make a very strong Kurdish case and is using Mujahid's term, having like this kind of a core Kurdish identity being more than anything, more important than anything else and to try to basically achieve some uh, real results in Turkish politics. I mean, as a political scientist, it doesn't really strike me as being very realistic because at some point, if you think about the Kurdish question, which is so different than both Iraq and Syria, and I mean, we can always talk about that, I don't want to go there, but the, ultimately you have to basically establish cross ethnic coalitions with other actors to achieve something feasible in the foreseeable future. I mean, sure, maybe by 10 or 20 years, things may look very different for the Kurdish uh, self-determination, but at this point, I mean, like having a Kurdish party, which is maybe primarily a Kurdish party, is not going to have much uh, success given the contemporary Turkish politics. Thank you. Thank you. I know that uh, Hishyar raised his hand, and I can imagine Hishyar and Mujahid actually going uh, for quite a while. It, I, 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 the, the, what I'm going to suggest is some of the questions that the audience raised might actually help us uh, think through some of the things. So instead of instead of uh, having another round and turning into a two-person conversation, I'm going to suggest we address some of the questions that the audience sent, keeping in mind uh, the 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 uh, sort of uh, the uh, differences of opinion uh, between, let's say, Mujahid on the one hand and uh, uh, Hishyar Bey on the other. So the, the first question I'm going to uh, send, and now here, let's see, how do we do this? Answer live. I guess if I click on answer live, uh, 
you this now could the, everybody see this question it comes from uh, my colleague Fatma Mugegocek what about the issue of who HDP's audience is are they still planning to be a mainstream party of all the oppressed in Turkey or will it be forced to focus on Kurds rights alone I think thinking through this question might help us um, see perhaps some of the shades of difference uh, between uh, Mujahid and Hishyar Bey, because it also reminds me of a question that I had in the preparatory stages of our panel that I had shared with uh, Savra. How, how do we think of HDP? Do we think of HDP as a Kurdish party? Uh, then what do we do with uh, everybody who voted for HDP who are not Kurdish? If we say HDP is a Turkey's party, then are we actually doing injustice in that uh, Kurds do have uh, many representational issues in Turkey that relate to civil rights? So how exactly, where exactly do we put HDP in the larger scale of things in Turkish politics? So maybe thinking through this question might help. And a similar question that came from the audience that I'm going to release as well comes from... Um, here, I'm going to say answer live. And this question is, as uh, comes from uh, jo Jonas Sruji, as Hishyar said, the HDP is far more than a Kurdish movement, but a coalition of minorities, both religious, ethnic, sexual, political, etc. really any marginalized group. If HDP is banned and a new party follows, will it be able to keep this coalition together? Or we'll say the socialists currently in the HDP umbrella instead of go to the CHP. Uh, thanks, Jonas Suji, Embassy of DK. I imagine that is Denmark, maybe in Ankara, and a bit of post Ottoman historian from my time at the university. So really enjoying this discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and in preparation for the next question, in the, the next questions will be about Dilek as presentation. Dilek, you can look at the questions, and I'm going to release them after people have a chance to answer, uh, to respond to these two questions. Okay, so who would like to go to first in response to the two questions? Kishyar, may I ask you to go first? Yeah. Your hand is up already, please. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I mean, this is a very uh, friendly environment to, uh, to, to have a debate. And please, Baki Hoja, uh, you also <laughs> feel at ease. I mean, we are gonna have a very nice friendly debate here. So the question is so good, what uh, Miguel Hoja actually asked, who is HTP's audience? Let me, I ask, I raise my hand to give some more information to better understand uh, the HTP, the structure of the HTP. So the HTP is a political party addressing all problems in Turkey, but with the Kurdish core, which is the main constituent. And we have the Democratic Regions Party is one of the five political parties who form the HTP. I am simultaneously a member of the Democratic Regions Party, which only uh, involves in uh, regional politics, mostly organized in Kurdish municipalities, actually. If you remember in 2014, the HDP had no local governments actually. It was mainly, I mean, we run in the local elections through the DBP, Democratic Regions Party, which is the kind of like the more the Kurdish party per se. I am simultaneously a member, a representative of Democratic Regions Party, but we are part of the Kurdish element within the HDP. So in that sense, we do have a Turkey agenda, but we also have a regional agenda that is being implemented by the Democratic Regions Party. And we think that these two do not cancel out each other because the Kurds do have some claims to sovereignty, which Mujahid mentioned actually, and Democratic Regions Party is trying to develop a decentralized political system in Turkey, some autonomous political system so that Kurdish demands for sovereignty can be at least partially accommodated. So in that sense, I think like being for a you know, party for all Turkey and specifically focusing on the Kurdish issue doesn't necessarily contradict each other. That is kind of the productive tension that we are working through. It is not that, for example, I mean, within the HTP, we have so many groups and we never deny our own identities. We don't do that. But, but it's kind of an experiment where I, as a Kurdish politician, 
uh, exchange with a lot of Armenian, Alevi people, the labor movement, women's movement. We somehow share each other's struggles and we try to develop kind of a joint political vision for the future of the country, within which we think we may be able to also address the Kurdish demands, even if partly. This is one. The second, if the HTP is shut down, is closed, I would like to remind you that the HTP as a political party was established by HDK, which is the Halkların Democratic Congress. The Congress is a much bigger umbrella organization which actually established the HTP to run in the election. So if, if the HTP is shut down, the Congress actually, the, the Congress is much bigger, broader than the party itself. I think this time we will have even a bigger kind of thing, and many other people will be joining the HTP. One last thing, and this is the anthropologist in me. I'm sorry, no longer I'm a politician now. So there was a criticism of romance, like the romance of uh, like resistance and these kinds of things. I mean, as an, in quotation marks, enlightened, rational person, like many of you who spend a lot of time in academia, I personally do not believe in romance. And I see, you know, a lot of mythologies within the Kurdish movement. That was my job. I was trying to analyze, rationalize, interpret them, right? I may not need a romance of resistance as an, in quotation mark, enlightened scholar or intellectual or whatever. But believe me, many people who are fighting in specific contexts of struggle, they need all kinds of romance and mythologies of resistance because for them, it is not a matter of analysis. It is a matter of survival. So in that sense, my take on romance is more kind of an anthropological uh, take and I think sometimes romance mythologies of resistance or some people are in need of them I think we need to understand in that sense because those romances those mythologies are produced actually by concrete people in specific historical context of struggle so in that sense I am although critical of like you know uh, romanticization in general per se but I think there is still value to uh, romance. I am, I am still, I am in defense of romance, partly, just to clarify that point. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ersoy. Um, I see Sarah's hand and Milai's hand raised. I imagine they would, I, I'm looking at the hands on the, you know, when you, you raise your hand from the uh, control functions. So I'm going to go the order of responses will be Sarah first, Nilay second, and Mujahid third. Yes, please. Um, I think my, um, rather than um, answering any question, I think I want to ask, I want to answer by asking another question. So I think the question of who, um, who is it that HTP represents is an important question when they, when, um, when HDP is not under the attack of this, what the panel calls the, the judicial coup. So um, I think we are now not at the point of who the HDP represents, but if the HDP will be able to stay in this political, political arena. And um, I think also it's important to remember why the HDP is under the risk of closure. So it's the connection again, the government is making, as it always does, uh, to connect the HDP with the Kurdistan Workers' Party. And through making that connection, I think uh, there's a statement made by the government that um, the war will continue and the con this continuation of the war is taking this form of closing HDP. So I feel like we're we have to keep that in we have to keep that in mind when we're thinking about the current moment in which we're living and we are discussing the HDP. And um, and that's why I think it's important to um, not separate the HDP's closure case from the war from the warfare within which this closure case is unfolding. And uh, the connection between the closure of the HTP with the politics, dissent politics of the Kurdish movement. And uh, maybe we can hold on to our questions of who the HTP represents at this point. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, Nila, you had raised your hand too, please. Um, yeah, a few years ago, um, 
I was back in Mardin, that was around the June elections time, and there were a few discussions within HDP, HDP about like the representations concerning the LGBTQIA communities, and then uh, the existence of a little bit of pushback from the more uh, Islamic, Islamist, conservative, however you want to describe it, uh, components of the HDP. I think, in a way, I would like to second Shiar's uh, comment about that, because when it comes to political parties, we don't quite uh, imagine that their constituencies, their audiences are always always monolithic, or they always agree on everything. Um, I I'm wondering if CHP, JHP, very unlikely, uh, claimed to voice the you know uh, demands or the difficulties of the LGBTQIA communities, what would their constituency's reaction would be? There are like across the spectrum, more conservative reactions within the CHP as well. So I think um, the point that I would like to highlight here is uh, just like any other constituency of any other political party, there are like rifts, fault lines, discrepancies, uh, disagreements with, within the HDP as well as someone from outside, as I can see. And I think it would be really not only unrealistic, but also unfair to expect HDP to uh, re you know, represent or be a mainstream party of all the oppressed in Turkey. Because, uh, and politics is, I think, quite conjunctural. Uh, when H HDP needs to make certain moves, maneuvers, choices within certain political contexts, prioritizing certain groups demands at the expense of others, I think we shouldn't be, uh, I'm not saying that the question implies that, but I'm taking this as an opportunity to dwell on this a little bit more. We shouldn't uh, see this from a more like idealized point of view. HDP is also a political party. It is very diverse. And I think this is the, like what makes it unusual or unique in my uh, sense from my point of view is that it tries to voice uh, as many voices as possible under its roof. So I think what comes out of that uh, conversation or that conflict might or might not be productive, might or might not help HDP, because there are times that I don't agree with HDP, everything that HDP is um, saying or doing with respect to these diverse groups. Uh, but I think we shouldn't idealize HDP as the representative or have, having to carry the burden of being the representative of, the, of the, all the oppressed groups. Uh, and I think Turkish political public, um, it's good time to model their politics on the possibility of, because I think there is a yearning, there is a demand within the Turkish political uh, communities as well. A group, a body that represents all the oppressed. And I think it's high time that HDP needs to be mimicked in terms of its uh, willingness to voice as many vo voices as possible within its uh, you know, scope. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nilay. Mujahid, please go ahead. Okay, I would like to say a few things about Bilgin Ayata's uh, question. Am I blaming the victim? Uh, and uh, you know, while there is this assault, uh, why are we criticizing HDP? Well, I, because this is because I believe the reason, structural reason, for why the course of Kurdish politics is so predictable, so replicating, is that there is a problem there. That so I'm drawing attention to that problem. So in a sense, I'm addressing that very problem uh, that. Um, we, we perhaps uh, don't see or we don't want to see, at least from my point of view. Uh, why is it that Kurdish politics is so predictable, my friends? Why do we know that they, they can close the party and a new party will be formed and will have further oppressions and further resistance? We'll celebrate and academics are going to rejoice in deconstructing all those processes and so on. Uh, so I, I see a structural problem here. Uh, and going back to the root of the problem, I think HDP is neither really a Turkey party as it claims to be or wants to be. And how it can be is, is a comment I want to come back. And secondly, uh, it's dissociation, even for strategic reasons, proper dissociation from Kurdish armed movement has to be discussed and settled uh, and uh, um, placed in, in, in front of the Turkish public in a way that is convincing 
forceful and so on and so forth. So there are structural problems that needs to be solved. All I'm doing is to draw attention to them. Is a Kurdish party viable? Uh, Murat's question and, or Mugyanum's question, which is uh, who is the real audience? I believe that there is a mistaken assumption that to be a Turkey partisi, a Turkey-wide political party, HDP has to shy away from Kurdishness or Kurdish policies or making Kurdish stuff prominent. This is a, I approach this as a rather libertarian, uh, a, a, a democratically oriented uh, uh, a person, not a right wing or, nor Kurdish nationalist. I'm, a, I'm critical of Kurdish nationalism and they hate me. Uh, let me tell you guys that. Although those on the left, if anybody doesn't think like them, they should be right wing. So that's the kind of easy uh, uh, way to think about uh, uh, uncomfortable uh, opinions. So I think to be, if you think of politics in the sense of Arendt and others, politics is plurality. You have to, not just diversity inside your party. You have to oppose, be able to oppose, be not only courageous, subject enough to oppose Mehepe, AKP and others, and your own fearsome, you know, secularity, modernity, postmodernity desires. Uh, to, you have to be a subject, you have to demand something so that you balance other bad guys and you can become a terribly bad guy and you need to be balanced by others who are demanding their own interests. And that balance of interests, okay, is what produces democracy. Kurds cannot contribute to democracy because they lack in subjectivity, in my opinion. They please, there is a theatrical performance of, uh, of politics, but there isn't this strong desire sovereignly felt subject to uh, on the part of Kurdish politics. So I might be wrong, but that's how I, I see uh, the situation. On the question of uh, romanticism in politics, yeah, absolutely, I think as a practicing politician, uh, Ishiar Ossoy is absolutely right. You have to have myths, you have to have stories, you have to have narrative to lead crowds. They need stories. The problem is that Kurdish politics picks its stories from uh, dissertations, you know, Foucault, post-structuralism, not from everyday life reality of Kurdish people in the streets of Diyarbakir or on the streets of Istanbul. There is always, of course, sufficient base, enough room, enough uh, demographic ground to perform some really ultra progressive politics, but that keeps you at the level of activism and doesn't make you third largest party in Turkey which has this packaged votes from its base and typically wastes it and wastes itself. It's a, it's a painful situation. Not that I enjoy criticizing HDP, HDP but this is unfortunately uh, what I see. So of course, stories needs are necessary, but uh, we are having a different type of question. I think Sabri Ateş's question here is uh, interesting in terms of Turkey party uh, issue. Uh, uh, who else is worried about being Turkey party? That should be a clue for proper thinking about HDP. No other party worries about being Turkey party because they are Turkey party. And guess what? HDP is a Turkey party regardless of what it says. It represents citizens of Turkey, whether they are Kurds or not. So here is the question. The most important problem of Turkey, Turkish politics of Turkey is Kurdish question. A, a democratic Turkish party that makes Kurdish question its primary cause, primary issue is not Kurdish, doesn't have to be Kurdish, doesn't have to uh, feel ashamed about being Kurdish. And I think that psychology uh, is, uh, has been disabling HDP from being properly effective. We are not talking about a tiny little minority that is doomed forever to be an activist group, protest and so on, but we are talking about a large uh, segment of Turkish society, third largest party that should imagine itself as a shareholder, as a coalition uh, member and so on and so forth. A party wanting power, seeking power, working for power and having that flexibility and transformative desire combined. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, we will go to Dilek, but because uh, Mujahid mentioned Sabri Atesh's question, I just wanted to, uh, for the recording on YouTube, not they, they are not able to see those questions. I just released that question for the participants at the webinar, the, uh, and I'll read it. Question for Ursoy. 
the HDP is always asked to be a Turkey partisi. Why doesn't HDP ask Turks which Turkish party is a Turkey partisi, advocating for the rights of all non-Turkish groups as well? Is E, MHP, CHP, AKP, etc., are really Turkey parties or Turk parties? Would only be prudent if HDP publicly problematizes that constant of Turkish politics. Sabri Atesh asks, and um, I mean, this is my personal just addition to it. We, I sometimes wonder whether we do a service when we always talk about the Kurdish issue, because we, we, we talk, when we name it that way, it appears as if Kurds um, are a problem or there is a Kurdish issue, but, but it looks like we actually have a democracy and representation issue that belongs to all of us. Perhaps that might be it. I mean, again, I'm not quite sure when you say it that way, then it, you underestimate the daily repression Kurdish people do face. So I'm not quite sure how one can walk this tight rope and be fair to both sides, but since the question was asked to Mr. Uh, Ursul, Dr. Ursul, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Baki. I mean, I think here we are having a major issue, a, 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 a methodological issue problem. Mujahid, Sabri Hoja, they are asking questions without thinking about the context. The HDP was established as a political party within the context of an ongoing peace process. And the idea was to build peace in Turkey simultaneously while the DDP was trying to build some kind of an autonomous administration in Kurdish provinces. Okay. And at that time, as Mujahid would like to call them, Kurdish politicians were politicians because they, because they were negotiating with the Turkish state establishment with President Erdogan and this and that. They were not activists. And if they are now activists, the way Mijahit is saying, that is mostly because now the establishment is trying to implement a crackdown on them. There is no peace process. So the kind of ground in which the HDP became a political actor no longer exists. So if you want to really criticize the HDP, which is my criticism, the HDP needs to position itself, reposition itself, because there is no longer the climate of peace and negotiations of 2022, three, four, five. As Sarah was saying, we have the rule of war. And within that context, how the HDP should reposition itself. And my criticism to HDP is that HDP is still using the kind of comfortable discourses of 2014 and 15, when there was an actual peace process, when HDP leaders were every single day on mainstream media channels, TVs, everywhere. Okay. So being a politician does have a broader political context. That was the peace process. We no longer have that. That is number one. So uh, when we say the HDP being a party for Turkey, it was an instrument to push for the peace agenda within the Turkish publics, right? And I think that's quite rational to do. I mean, at the same time, if you remember artists, singers, I don't know, movie actors, they were all trying to discuss the Kurdish issue. The HDP emerged within such a specific political context. Please keep that in mind. The criticism against the HTP is that while Kurdish people say that you became a Turkish party and all the Turkish people within the HTP are criticizing us that we became another Kurdish party actually. So within the HTP, we are really trying to balance some of these conflicts contradictions. I swear there is almost no issue we have agreement within the HTP. I served as deputy chair for five years, central executive board member for five years. We have never ever had any consensus on, on almost anything, but still this is politics. There are all kinds of conflicts and contradictions which Nilay so nicely put. I mean, sometimes we go for an agenda, many groups, they object to it. So it is always a negotiation within the HTP. And for me, to be very honest, very fair, 2014, I was an academic still. The idea of HTP was killing me. I just hated it, honestly. I said, like, we already have our party. Why there is a need for another HTP? Why was it? I came, I joined the HTP. What I saw was this. 
it is really an experimental space, I would say, within which I do not lose my Kurdishness and Kurdish identity. My name is Ishiar, it is a Kurdish name. I come from a very kind of Kurdish family and political background, but within the HDP, it is in a way a political experiment where we are exchanging with many other groups, women's movement, ecology movement, uh, Turkish left, anarchist, conservative, democrats, whoever wants to raise some voice around a minimum political program. It is not that Nilay is very right. I mean, we are not very ambitious. We don't claim to represent every oppressed person, but that is the claim, right? We claim to represent, you know, whoever wants to get represented. That is our promise. But the HDP is not erasing the Kurdish identity or Kurdish political struggle. In fact, my argument is within the HDP and outside, there is a very vibrant Kurdish community waging a political struggle there as well. So in that sense, this, this is the, the, the question that we get the most is, is this the task of the Kurds to democratize Turkey? Right? This is actually the main question. Why should we work for democracy in Turkey? Turkish people should do it. I sincerely believe this. Yes, it is the Turkish people who should be doing this, but they are not doing it. So how we are going to resolve address the Kurdish issue, right? So the HDP kind of gave a platform where at least some Kurdish, Turkish people are somehow joining, like those, for example, in Boazici University, for example. Many of them actually are our voters, and many of them are, I would say they are, like Turkish, there are Turkish people there. So it is not that like we claim that we represent all Turkish people, but as I said, it was a political device to perpetuate the peace process within the Turkish publics. That specific context should be kept in mind when you know there are questions and criticisms about why the HDP still assumes the identity of being a kind of party for all Turkey. Okay, it is historically, it is not just a choice that some guys you know, sat in a room and just made. Thank Within you. that historical context, it becomes meaningful. Thank you. Uh, Begin's hand is up. Begin has a weaker connection. Uh, if she, if we lose her the um, video, please don't be surprised. Okay, please begin. Yes, I had to switch to the what the, the personal hotspot or something to make it run. So I have my camera off. Just really a very. Uh, I've been following um, the exchange and. Um, I still don't quite understand uh, what we're discussing here. It seems to me, uh, especially uh, from um, the focus that have been, has been now reintroduced again, and I really don't mean this in any you know, personal attacking way or so, Mijayat, but it seems to me that uh, why we're, you know, uh, if we were sitting here and speaking about sexual violence and rape and uh, the discussion about the length of the skirt has come up, I just don't get this. I really have to say it. Um, how come that we keep now talking what um, the HDP uh, should or should not do, right? This or that, but uh, we are talking here about once again another party closure, right? So unless you suggest that the reason for the party closure is uh, are the Kurds, you know, the, the HDP themselves, then, you know, please, uh, that should be stated that way. But I think we should really, uh, you know, <laughs> look again at the larger issue that is at stake. And uh, just as a small reminder, maybe up until 1991, officially the term Kurds did not even exist in the political. So um, I would like really to uh, frame the discussion or see the discussion uh, really less focusing on what the Kurds should or should not do, but, but rather to understand what is this political constituency and system based on that cannot that cannot open itself up for such a politics that has been outlined. Thank you. Ignoring, ignoring your rather inappropriate analogy, I want to thank you for reminding me that Kurdish was not allowed up until 90s. I didn't know that. Thank you. I did not remind you about that. And don't, as I said, it's not, uh, it's not, it wasn't. I don't just, see, I mean, you are personalizing it and you know, that, that's really inappropriate. What you did is inappropriate. I will just say that. Thank you. No one else perceives it that way. I'm, I'm offering criticism here. I said, I'm gonna offer criticism. The panel organizers could have told me we are here to criticize others 
and not HDP. So if if you don't want me on this panel, I, I can understand that, but I mean, this is not a personal thing. So that comment, I hope you, you withdraw. Uh, I don't. I don't. Okay. All right, uh, thank you. Um, I don't. Everyone, I don't. Right. Right. You want to <laughs> other this questions? This course reframing, right? So this course shift. There are quite, Bilgin and Mujahid, there are quite a few questions in the Q&A that we did not address. And I promised uh, there were a couple that belonged, uh, that were directed to Dilek. Uh, Carol, do you want to take them and release them and read them? Yes, that would be my pleasure. So now we're going to redirect our engagement on this very robust and vibrant issue by introducing again, the realm of international law and legal frameworks. So Dr. Kurban, there are a couple of questions that have been directed towards you. One of the participants asked specifically, um, if you could speak about your conclusions pertaining to the use of the European Court of Human Rights and International Law more generally, encountering the current authoritarian offensive against the HDP. Continuing, given the problems related to the ECTHR's general approach to the Kurdish question, for example, non-contextualized, a narrow approach, or legalism, et cetera, what can we expect from that court? Now, a second and related question from another participant asks, can you please elaborate on the ECTHR's decision of November 3rd, 2020, regarding the HDP deputies? And how did the court justify its conclusion that, quote, HDP lacked victim status, end of quote? Um, thank you for um, these questions. I mean, the first one, of course, is a very legitimate one, right? Um, you know, given, because in the end, the ECHR has, it's really not new to this conflict. It has been educating Turkey's Kurdish conflict since the early 1990s. Um, and so, so it's actually the best position situated international authority, not just legal, but international institution um, in terms of familiarity with the history of the conflict, with the, with the political context, etc. And yet it's quite disillusioning, actually, when you look at the jurisprudence of the court. Now, having said that, um, you know, it was mentioned before, you know, the Jim Crow and, and the South. And, you know, when you look at the civil rights movement, for example, in the U.S., right, or any other um, um, uh, liberation movements or movements against um, oppression, apartheid, segregation, uh, discrimination, whatnot, it takes time and it's a constant, constant, constant legal struggle. Um, as rightful as we are to be disillusioned with the ECHR, I think it's really important to keep pushing because especially for victims, you know, I've done a lot of field work when, I, you know, years ago, um, talking to Kurdish victims of um, state violence. And it is really, really important for them to at least have recognition, validation of the violations that has happened to them. So when, and, and we know that the Turkish judiciary is basically not, and this has been always the case, and certainly now even more so, is that not, I mean, let alone effective judicial review, there's no judicial review in Turkey, right? The courts basically don't want to look into this and they take the sides of the, of the official, um, you know, rhetoric. So it's really important for victims to at least have a body, especially something like the ECHR, to say um, that the violation actually indeed has occurred. So this kind of vindication. And so, of course, you know, coupled with compensation and whatnot. Um, but I think, so, so the first immediate answer I gave to this is that we have to keep uh, litigating because, you know, especially for lawyers that, you know, it's their job. That's what they have to do. You know, when you're plan representing your client, you have to do this until the end. Right. But in terms of international more broadly, I think that's a very good question because it's not the ECHR, of course. There are various mechanisms, non-judicial mechanisms under international law that should and are also pursued. Um, UN um, treaty bodies, the Council of Europe has treaty bodies. But I do not see when I look you know, from the outside, I don't see a holistic strategy uh, on the part of the of the Kurdish political movement, right? Um, HDP and others. I don't see a sort of, you know, strategic litigation and wealth or strategy of, okay, which issues should we take to the ECHR? Which issues should we take to the Human Rights Committee? Because the committee actually is, um, is, is often more progressive, although its judge decisions are not binding um, on especially on minority rights. It is really important to keep the pressure on. 
Um, and I'll tie this to my answer to the second question on, on the HDP. It's an inadmissibility decision. So by definition, these decisions are quite short. Um, but actually, this is a relatively maybe a long one. And it's um, the court, it's really actually quite problematic. The court, it's an area where it seems like the court doesn't have enough jurisprudence. So the court makes an, it refers to its previous judgments concerning trade unions and associations who were litigating on behalf of their members, right? So the court says, in the past, I've said this, right? An association does not have standing when its members are subject to violation or vice versa. And the same goes for association. Now you cannot analogize to a political party, right? Because a political, you cannot think of political parties independent of their deputies or mayors, especially when you think of how we vote in Turkey. You know, when you go to the ballot, you don't see the num names of individual deputies. You have the party, you vote for the party, right? So of course the HTP should have standing. And it is, it is an extremely uh, problematic uh, decision, especially when, because it had came only one month before this it's a really good grand chamber judgment where the court really made the contextual analysis. But this brings me um, ties um, to um, the first question and the HDP. In that decision, the court also says, because the HDP said, you know, as um, Dr. Oso said earlier, so and so many uh, number of deputies have been arrested and mayors, etc. The court says something there, notes something, says there's no information in terms of the progress of these criminal proceedings. Made me wonder why not, right? And I wondered how this um, pleading, what this application was prepared to the ECHR. Because, you know, that's, that's another thing. You know, of course you have a supranational court that, is just has been, um, and more and more so, less accessible, you know, issuing inadmissibility decisions, especially these days, you know, it has a very problematic relationship with the Turkish Constitutional Court, et cetera, but you really have to do your best. And another thing that the court says in the inadmissible decision is that the HDP did not apply to the Turkish Constitutional Court. Now, as much as, you know, we can say what we want about the Turkish Constitutional Court, Again, as a lawyer, you have to do that to show that you've exhausted domestic remedies. Now, I don't know, Shiar, you know, what happened there. But so these are the kind of, the thing is, when you are like the Kurds in Turkey, but not just everywhere, you know, or, or think about the civil rights movement in the US, you just need to be smarter, smarter, you know, and more um, strategic than the oppressor, because the oppressor is, is mighty, is strong. Um, and you won't always, I think, that the international law and international judicial institutions will always be on the side of the victim is certainly not, should not be taken as a given. Can, can I just give a bit of information there, Bakyosha? Just information. Uh, please, if it relates to this, please. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So when, 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 when immunities were lifted, we applied to the European Court of Human Rights, both as a political party and also as individual deputies. So when we applied as a political party, it is that one that was dropped by the European Court of Human Rights, because when we applied to them at the time, there were no consequences of the lifting of immunities. Okay, And so that is why it got rejected. But our individual uh, files, they were accepted by the European Court of Human Rights, including my own, I think, 42 or 43 people files. They are still uh, pending at the European Court of Human Rights. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to um, direct a question to Dr. Hakimez. Um, one of the participants, I'm releasing it now. So one of the participants wants more of a clarification in terms of how you're constructing and understanding the enemy law, which was perpetuated against the idea of a Kurdish political prisoner. And so um, if you could elaborate a bit more in terms of the master-slave narrative by focusing a bit more on the perspective or aspect of the slave in your configuration. How do slaves possibly react to the idea of a master in this configuration? What might that look like um, in terms of the transformation of individuals who are understood as slaves to this configuration of being more perceived as an enemy. And finally, um, could the Kurds or their defenders thus create a new space for negotiation? Uh, 
Okay, um, now you can hear me, right? Um, thank you for this brilliant question. And uh, let me just um, clarify what I meant by the master slave dialectic. Um, I was using it in order to explain, uh, in order to emphasize how Turk as a signifier was um, serving as the figure of the master um, that was situating itself against the other, the other becoming the slave. And, um, and I was saying that the ones who do not surrender, surrender to that subjectivity, to that subjective position of slave would be called the enemy. So the ones who do not surrender to, the sub, to that subject position would be called the enemy who would be brought to the courts, who would be either killed in, uh, through extrajudicial killings, who'd be, who would be confined um, and put, under, put behind bars. Um, that's, so the relation between those defendants and the state, I would say, is the relation of friend-enemy. I mean, through the distinction of friend-enemy, that, um, that relation was created. And, um, that doesn't mean that um, the enemy doesn't have any option when um, they are brought before the courts. But um, I think I can connect this to what Dilek was saying, strategic litigation. But although she was talking in a different context, the cases brought to the European Court of Human Rights, I can still use the term lawfare um, that was um, used by Kurdish defendants to um, defend themselves against the charges of uh, different terrorist crimes. So lawfare is definitely waged in Turkish courtrooms as well, but I think I, we need to also uh, remember the limits of this lawfare. Lawfare can only happen if one it, uh, if one accepts the premises of the judicial system. So um, defending yourself against the charges of terrorism would mean that you would also dissociate yourself from the PKK. And at this point, we're really not talking about um, what, what, where, where, what is the place of the PKK in the political um, in the political universe of the Kurdish movement, but I would say that uh, not all these Kurdish defendants would really dissociate themselves from the PKK in order to wage this lawfare. On the contrary, some of them would uh, challenge the grounds of legitimacy of all these trials, saying that the PKK itself is an anti-colonial movement that is there to decolonize Kurdistan. So I would call that kind of defense, the defense, the rupture defense that is challenging, that is questioning the grounds based on which these trials were, um, were launched. But then uh, that's, not the only, that's not the only strategy that is used. And um, uh, in order to not romanticize that position, I would also add uh, the other uh, strategy that is used, which would be called technical defense. Technical defense um, varies, and it is more like you use the procedural law in order to defend yourself, in order to, um, in order to defend yourself against the charges of terrorism. So you accept the premises of the judicial system, but you operate within it in order to, um, in order to both um, get out of uh, prison, perhaps, but also in order to, um, in order to give legitimacy to, to, to the Kurdish uh, movement, not through um, resort, not, not through defending the PKK, but through defending other organizations within the Kurdish movement. So I would say that there are at least two strategies. One is technical defense, the other is political defense. And uh, political defense takes different shapes over time. Um, so the political defense of the 1980s is not the same as the political defense of the 2000s. So in the, in the, um, in the 1980s, um, it was more common not to give, submit any defense and to judge the courts themselves. Um, while in the 2000s, it was more about not speaking back to the court and um, organizing silent protests that resulted in the recognition of Kurdish language uh, in, um, in, in courtrooms. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. 
And now let's see, I was going to release a question. This comes from my uh, dear colleague in the East Coast, Lerna Ekmekcioğlu. Uh, let me read it. Romance of resistance becomes a problem when it is not backed up either by a functioning and fair local and international legal system or by guns and guerrillas that are strong enough. I observed it during the last Karabakh war. Armenians of the region have a similar mythology that was sustained for a long time when there was peace, but is going through a significant trauma, including self killed and blaming each other after the Azeri Turkish takeover. And um, I guess this is a, perhaps more of a directed question than a comment that speaks to a discussion we had. Uh, any any of the panelists would like to add something to this? If so, we'll go. If not, we can go with one of the questions. Another question. I oh, you are raising your hands with raising your hand here. So yes, I see that. Uh, Gunesh, please go ahead. So just very briefly, and then I will put my political scientist hat. And this is a little bit like disagreeing slightly with what Sarah discussed earlier. And I'm I completely agree with her analysis of the legal system. But it's important to keep in mind that. The recent case against the HC ban that I will also link into Lana's question is not because there's a very active guerrilla movement in Turkey at the moment. I mean, if you look at what is happening since 2015, since the trench warfare, I think it is fair to say that Turkish state managed to militarily contain the PKK insurgency. I mean, you can basically talk about all the activities through the drones, all the Turkish incursions into Iraqi Kurdistan and so on. But I mean, if you look at actual number of people who are getting killed and activities, it is clear that PKK no longer presents a very strong threat to Turkish state as it used to, I would say, before 2015. So this is important to keep in mind because the previous case against the Kurdish parties were much more closely linked to PKK activity. But now we have a situation in which PKK was more or less contained by the Turkish state, but then there's a new situation, which is obviously just south of the border in, uh, in Syria, where PYD, which is obviously linked to the PKK, established a self-governing system. So coming back to Lerna's question, I mean, yes, in a sense, it is no longer a case that you can actually talk about a very vibrant and very maybe uh, proactive guerrilla moment, which can actually put lots of pressure on the government. But obviously then the question becomes, if the time of the armed struggle became a question of the past, then how are, how are you going to pursue nonviolent strategies so that you can actually achieve some gains for the Kurdish people? And obviously this is just all the discussion we have been uh, having lately in the last hour. But in this sense, yes, I mean, this the area of romanticism is, I think, passed to very clearly. I think Sarah's hand was up and Nilay, I see also Nilay's hand is up. Uh, please, Sarah first, Nilay after. Uh, I think um, Gunesh Murat says, um, I mean, the, the point you're making is really important. And uh, I was wondering when we would talk about why now, why um, is this HDP closure case now? What kind of war is happening against which this decision was taken? And when I say war, I'm not only talking about an active low or high intensity war between the PKK guerrilla, between PKK guerrilla fighters and the Turkish army, because counterinsurgency war is always more than that, right? Um, it does not only address, it does not only attack uh, Kurdish guerrillas, it's not only a response to armed, ins to, um, to, to guerrillas, it's also a response, a very lethal response to, um, to, to the civilians who support and who, who support the cause of the Kurdish movement. And um, it would be a bit unfair to say that, I mean, it would be a bit, I wouldn't agree with you in the sense that uh, the armed struggle is over because uh, we know what, I mean, it's only, you will see it uh, as, you will see it only that way if you do not look at Rojava. And I think the connections between uh, Bakur and Rojava uh, are very important for us to ignore. And, um, but then I think there's another war happening. So it's not only armed resistance in Rojava or Kurdish population support to the, Kurd, uh, to the cause of the Kurdish movement, but also I think um, 
There are multiple wars happening in Turkey uh, against which the um, MHP and AKP governments are uh, collaborating with each other to solidify their power. And um, in order to talk about that, I think we have to talk about populist authoritarianism. Like um, the, um, the Turk that is the master signifier is a gender Turk, is a racialized Turk, is a sexualized Turk, and uh, it is a class Turk. And I think uh, all these oppressed groups um, are actually fighting in their own ways in Turkey against which this populist of authoritarianism is coming into existence. So um, when I talk about war, I'm not only talking about an active war between the PKK and the military, but all these wars happening in different fronts. Um, against which I think the AKP is now responding the way it is responding. And plus, to relate it back to Birgin's point, I think it is the AKP is able to, the, to do that because it is able to afford it because of the position that European Union is taking. So that's, yeah, that's my response. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Nilay, please go ahead. I'm gonna keep it very brief because Sarah actually touched upon it. I was just gonna highlight the Rojava experience because I think this is the thing with the Kurdish issue. I also don't wanna use the Kurdish question or Kurdish political movement in the Middle East. It's almost always impossible to talk about it only within the context of one nation state. And when I look at the armed movement or armed struggle component of the Kurdish struggle at large, uh, what I'm not, I'm not seeing a struggle contained by the state. I see a struggle consciously ch uh, channeled to a different component of Kurdistan. And it's not just like the rechanneling of the armed groups to a different part of Kurdistan, but also like that ideal that we have been talking about. H how did Kurdish society change in the past 20 years? How did their political imagination change? What groups did they entail? I think uh, it would have been really nice if we had another three hours and discuss all of these issues in relation to the Rojava experience. I don't think it's, it can be an afterthought. I don't think it can be a trivial uh, point here. And I, so in a cyclical manner, I would like to go back to my original point. It's in 2012 that Kurds made this conscious decision to bring the like parts of Syria under their autonomous rule and like become the flag bearers against the ISIS terror in the area. So I think it is really, it's, it's really helpful for me to see these conscious political decisions that they, that they make in really, really dire circumstances. And I would like to thank everybody, but I don't think I will take more time after this point. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ossoy, Hishyarbe, please. Uh, because there is a question, a repeated question about the HDP and the PKK and the closure case, which is, you know, a question we most often get. Just to clarify just one thing, the closure uh, case against the HDP has nothing to do with uh, our uh, relationship with the PKK, I should say. Um, when you look at the indictment itself, for example, there are a lot of photos of HDP deputies and leaders with PKK leaders in the Kandil Mountains. But those visits were made possible by, actually they were made upon the request of the Turkish government itself. I mean, that is the fun bit of this whole theater of uh, the court. So when they asked Ahmed Turk, for example, why he met Abdullah Öcalan in prison, Abdullah Öcalan is on an island, actually. You can only go to there with a boat, right? He said that actually he didn't swim to the island. The boat was provided by the government. Okay, so the closure case, as I said, the HDP was established during the peace process to build peace in Turkey because the context and discourse of uh, politics, the dominant one, which was peace, like five years ago, there was a radical shift from peace to war, right? And within that context, the HDP became the enemy of the state while it was the interlocutor for the peace process. In fact, the Turkish government was imploring, was begging the HDP to communicate with the PKK. So to conclude, it is not the assumed distance or proximity between the HDP or the PKK. 
We have the closure case now, precisely because the government doesn't want to engage both the armed Kurdish struggle and the broader Kurdish question, which is a regional one, in a political and peaceful way. That is why we have this closure case. It has nothing to do with our proximity or distance from the PKK. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we picked, Carol and I picked one final question from among the audience questions. Uh, Carol will release that and read it uh, for our participants uh, to respond very briefly, maybe, uh, in, or anyone among our participants. But as she is reading that question and releasing that, I will also be releasing all of the questions that came just to share them with uh, all of the uh, audience members. And then I will ask our panelists to read them and then consider whether they'd like to address any one of them in their closing remarks. So we are answering one question and then we are moving to closing remarks after in response to all of the questions combined, each part panelist will think about what to say. We are hoping to finish in half an hour from now, not to hold our panelists any longer than they already have been staying here. Uh, okay, Carol, you go ahead. Okay, so um, this is a question that is typically asked in this very political um, climate that we all exist in our specific arenas. And it's always around the idea of what can individuals do who also might not necessarily be aware or as engaged with any particular topic. What does international solidarity look like? What might that look like actually? And especially given um, these very particular authoritarian right reactionary movements, I think the space for international solidarity as well as solidarity amongst anti-oppression work, as well as I'm going to throw this in because I think it's something that some of you have mentioned in by, um, by length is um, like an element of interspecies work because I believe it was his share, you ended up talking specifically around how this is impacting the environment. I mean, there's a lot of different levels of violence taking place that's also directed towards our non-human animals that also happen to reside on this planet. So um, thank you, Saigun, for that question. I saw one of our panelists say something on yeah, this. You would like to respond. Dilek, yes. please. Dilek. I mean, I think it is um, very, not that it's easy to be done, of course, but it's really important to, um, uh, to mobilize the international community. And here, when I say international community, I'm talking about in people societies, um, particularly in Europe. Um, I mean, it remains to be seen what impact the new administration in the US will have. I mean, that's going to take some time for obvious reasons. Um, Biden is now very focused on the domestic issues, et cetera. But, um, you know, for the EU, particularly Germany, um, I just, you know, it, it's German government. I'm talking especially here. I mean, we can mention the EU-Turkey deal before. It really, you know, I'm based in Berlin, in Germany, in Berlin, and I just, Find, I find it really striking how Angela Merkel has somehow emerged to this position of the liberal democratic leader. Um, it's sort of like the, you know, the one of a few rare species who's very our dream political uh, politician when she's really um, caused um, um, uh, her, you know, the, the, the Turkey, the deal she uh, pulled up with Turkey has uh, been disastrous in terms of its consequences in Turkey. Uh, not just for the Kurdish um, conflict, but in general as well. So I think it is really important, and it's again, it's not easy, but it's really important to um, to tell these stories, to like to raise awareness, um, especially in the European um, sphere of what actually is going on in Turkey. I mean, we did not talk about um, it actually, but the state violence that has that occurred again in the region in you know summer of, starting from summer of two thousand fifteen is just incredible. I mean that that has happened. And it's and a one important difference here with the 90s is that when gross violations were happening in the 1990s, Turkey, uh, in the beginning, Turkey was not even a candidate to the for, for EC European Union membership. Today it's an accession country. It is not like Russia, it is not like China. 
I mean, I think these differences have to be emphasized that it is an accession country, which means that the EU has legal and obligations and moral and political obligations vis-a-vis -vis Turkey that there are that, that there is an autocratic, I mean, authoritarian turned autocratic government in Turkey actually raises EU's responsibility. And I think, and here, you know, I've had this discussion with colleagues at HDP, including um, Shiar. I believe, I mean, I maybe again, it's, you know, I'm speaking with the comfort of being in the outside. And of course, I know, I can only imagine how difficult it must be to be in the inside, especially to do politics. I favor, for example, pushing for campaigning for sanctions against Turkey, but not just economic sanctions, but for example, suspension of, to trigger the mechanism of suspending Turkey's membership to the Council of Europe, to remove the accession status. Um, and this, I know that, H, you know, I've, with, when I discuss it with HDP colleagues, they don't agree with that, but I think it's really important because that really would have consequential. I think we really need to think about and collectively push for consequential um, uh, um, sanctions um, against Turkey. On the, at the ECHR level, let me just conclude with, you know, again, going back to the ECHR. The, so the ECHR issues judgments, but the execution is done by a political body, which is the Committee of Ministers, which is made up of member states. To this day, in the entire system, there has only been one infringement proceeding um, that was brought against one country, which is Azerbaijan. Infringement proceeding is basically, you know, sanctions when a member state does not fulfill with, um, does not execute a particular ECHR judgment. I mean, it's just, I mean, there's not pressure on the Committee of Ministers to do that, but of course, I mean, just Mamadov was one political dis dissident in, in Azerbaijan. I mean, of course, you know, he was prisoned and of course he had his share of uh, pressure, government oppression too. But I mean, in, in Turkey, we're talking about thousands, you know, she I gave the numbers, just recent numbers. I think it's just somehow, and it is not easy. I, I don't know how to do it myself. So we're all doing our little shares, but I think it's important. And also maybe our individual, our collective response, what we can do here is this group and others, is perhaps to think together and, you know, start mobilizing that, you know, writing letters or whatnot. I mean, there's just so much mobilization now in EU against Poland and Hungary. Of course, they are EU members, obviously, but what, what is going on there dwarfs really in comparison to, to Turkey. So I think it's just important, like it's really imperative that, um, that we all um, help, of course, also if they want help, our colleagues at, at, at the HDP um, to sort of, um, to you know, and especially for those who are outside, because I think we have at least more resources in terms of mental resources. I mean, Turkey is draining people's energy in every way. And um, there's just so many battles that they can give. Um, but there are, I mean, you know, and it has to be multifaceted, legal, political dissent. Um, and for, um, you know, uh, the individual who asked this question and everybody else, I mean, I think for us also as meet for me too, for us to going beyond what we do as academics and whatnot, it's, it's just, you know, it's important to stay um, informed and then inform others as much as we can in our own little worlds. Thank you, Sarah? Sarah's hand was up. Uh, after Sarah, uh, we will take turns, the panelists will take turns with their closing remarks. And while they're making their closing remarks, while they're thinking about what to say, I encourage them to look at the questions one more time. We released all the questions we received. If there is one you would like to address while you're making your closing remarks, consider that. And if you choose to do so, please, Re make sure to read the question aloud for the uh, our audience who are watching us on YouTube and who will watch us in the future on YouTube too. So, Sarah, please go ahead. I want to um, I want to thank my colleague Saigon for this question and. Um, and that question can can uh, easily bring us back to the question of what the HDP represents, for whom the HDP speaks. But the question is not uh, asked in that spirit. And I want to um, just highlight that it's important. Or I think it's always important to distinguish the politics of representation from radical solidarity, which is, I think, what we need for now. And what I mean by radical solidarity is a commitment to the uh, to the idea that justice in, is indivisible. So. Uh, um, and um, also a commitment to an intersectional struggle. So if the HDP is now under attack, I think it is the responsibility of everyone to stand with 
the HDP. So instead of discussing whether these um, Turkish representatives in the HDP would go to CHP, I think um, is um, I think it is it is the moral obligation of the people in uh, CHP to stand with the HDP. So we. Um, so I think it's the time to make calls for radical solidarity. And um, in response to what Carol said about interspecies um, and uh, how our lives are, um, I mean, it's not only that human lives uh, are at stake, but also non-human lives as well. I think uh, Zosan Pehlivan's beautiful article on um, wildfires in Mount Judy is very important to understand how war devastates not only human lives, but uh, the non-human lives on which our lives depend. And um, that's why I think uh, this is not only an intersectional, but interspecies uh, solidarity that we need to forge forward. And thank you, everyone. Um, I think this is my closing remarks. Uh, all right, thank you. Thank you. I see Begin's hand is up. Oh, no, that was all right. So what we'll do now, uh, uh, all of our panelists have a chance to look at the remaining questions, and they might have also a few things left to say to each other's uh, remarks, perhaps. So in the remaining 20 minutes, uh, we'll go around uh, in the same order that we started. And uh, if we divide 20 minutes to uh, seven, three minutes, about three minutes each, so that we can really finish at 3 p.m. New York time. All right, uh, Dr. Ersoy, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Oh, there, there are fantastic questions there, but I don't have time to engage them. I'm so sorry. By this concluding remarks, I would like to just extend my greetings to everybody in the, uh, the list there. I have seen my classmates and I have seen other friends who are listening uh, from different parts of the world now. So I'm so excited. I want to say hi to all of them. I mean, at a time when the HDP is being silenced in Turkey with all this repression and everything, I would like to thank you, Bakyoja and Carol, and all the people who attended and uh, expressed their ideas for three hours now. Uh, given this whole tendency to silence the HDP, there was a lot of a lot of talk. It was good talk. It was all you know very valuable ideas and criticisms, even those very harsh. Uh, of course, I mean. We are a political party. It is an instrument uh, uh, which we devised at one point, we built, and uh, we are trying to respond to the demands, aspirations, and expectations of the people who find value in uh, HDP. I tend to oftentimes interpret like passionate criticisms of the HDP as an actual expectation from the HDP because people want the HDP to do more things actually, given that like the whole, I would say democratic society is suffocating in this country, in Turkey really. And, and, and we see that kind of a responsibility, of course, there are all kinds of expectations. And, but then the HDP is also limited by you know, structural constraints that we have, like you know, not just the pressures from the state, but these structural constraints, I mean, can be of different sorts. We have cultural ideological constraints as well. But one thing that we have done so far, I would say, I mean, we know the kind of historical responsibility that falls on the shoulders of the HDP as a political party. Um, and we are, we, are, we are getting closer to a very, very tough um, turning point, I would say, in uh, Turkish and Kurdish politics. I mean, the next elections, presidential elections, we are normally scheduled for 100th anniversary of the Republic, right? And it's very symbolic. And it is so unfortunate that the current government wants to have a parliament exactly like the one they had in 1923, which means a parliament that somehow cleared all kinds of, you know, in quotation marks, minorities, unwanted elements, including the curse, right? And so what we are trying to do is to somehow democratize the uh, Turkish uh, and Kurdish uh, political space uh, and uh, to have an inclusive uh, pluralistic 
uh, radically pluralistic uh, political formation and its parliament. The fight is going on. We are expecting more pressure, as I said in my presentation. But over decades, even a century of oppression and violence and persecution and, you know, victimization, all these kinds of things, uh, I think we have not, and I'm, I'm not just saying HDP, I am talking also about a lot of people who are now listening to us, I mean, in this conversation. We have accumulated enough experience, knowledge, and skills so that we can survive this ongoing attack on democracy. So in that sense, yeah, there is violence, there is repression, but then over, you know, a century of oppression, I think you, we have enough experience, we have enough knowledge and skills and, you know, solidarity. Uh, and and, and I, at the end of the day, I'm optimistic that we, we, we are, we are going to be able to overcome these challenges despite the direst political circumstances that, are, that we are in now. So thank you again, Baki, Carol, and all others who joined the debate. I very much appreciate all ideas and criticisms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making time to join us. Thank you. Uh, Nilay, would you like to say a few things? Yes, I promised that I wouldn't, but there was a question which caught my attention, which is about the role of academia in an era of political turmoil, which we briefly discussed. Uh, but now I'm wearing my uh, professor hat. And, um, you know, yes, being informed is important, but we are in a, we, we are in a luxury position. Every day we teach to a young group of people. And um, I feel like it's high time that um, we bring Kurds and other stateless groups to the center of our modern Middle East history survey courses and uh, emphasize their roles as more central as opposed to peripheral or marginalized and uh, talk more about them, incorporate their experiences into our syllabi, into our lectures and create an informed public because we have that luxury. We have a captive audience, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Nilay. Thank you very much. Um, and I think, Sazra, even though you said you didn't want to have closing remarks, I'm asking everybody now, and it's your turn. If there's a question that you found interesting and would like to address, please go ahead. It's up to you. I just want to thank um, Baki to you and Carol uh, for organizing this panel. And I want to thank everyone who um, participated in this panel. It was a pleasure for me to have this conversation with all of you. And um, with solidarity, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Sarra. Uh, I believe the next person in turn, was it Bilgin or Mujahid? How did we start this? Uh, not Bilgin, Mujahid maybe. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Mujahid. Okay. I would like to briefly respond to a question from uh, Gonja Sermes Pool. I would like Mr. Biligio and any other interested panelists to give specific examples of how else HDP could or should have handled the Handek crisis and also the crisis around Seni Başkan Yaptır Mijaz. I think Seni Başkan Yaptır Mijaz is a larger uh, discussion uh, with respect to Handek crisis. Uh, it was uh, terrorism, pure and simple. And I think uh, the why the act on the part of HDP would to would be to distance itself from it, reject it. Uh, unfortunately, it failed to do it properly. It led to destruction of Kurdish towns and civilians were used as shield uh, uh, for uh, military confrontation. Uh, so it was an unfortunate chapter in Kurdish history and I think a, a, an item on HDP's list of things to ponder in rethinking the future for itself. Uh, Except for a tiny glitch where a some sexist and pet thing, we had a, a excellent, professionally conducted session. I'd like to thank all the panelists and all the audience for uh, uh, listening and joining. And thank you all. Thank you, Baki and Carol. Bye. Thank you um, for those who may not know hen what Hendekrizi is. We might have to give a brief explanation perhaps, but I'm uh, hesitant to talk about it because I am not an expert on it either. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, I wonder whether what some of the 
remaining speakers could just very briefly summarize. Yeah, I'm going to let Dinesh do that as he finishes so that for the record, because we are having a YouTube and people are going to be listening to this, people who are not following Turkish politics as closely. Birgen, you go ahead, please, now. Yes, uh, I would like also maybe just, yeah, and to, uh, on the minority, um, uh, also building on what Dilek was just again bringing up and highlighting uh, on uh, Europe's position, um, it is important to see the alliances uh, that exist between Birgin, we are not able to hear you. Uh, let's try it again. Repeat your last couple of sentences. I, I couldn't hear you, which probably means other people couldn't either. I know you had a weak internet connection from where you are. Let's give it another try. Why don't you say one more time? Yes. Uh, Birgin, if you turn off the camera, it may improve. Especially when it looking. Is Let's see. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, solidarity, it is really important to see what the states are having when it comes to particular exclusions and uh, uh, marginalizations. Uh, can someone nod with the head if uh, you can hear me or if it's still bad connection? Okay, perfect. Um, <laughs> Here, the, the, the one issue that is really extremely worrisome here is um, uh, how refugees and the entire notion of migration has been uh, turned into a political instrument uh, in the regions. So um, Dilek was calling or you know, making the call for sanctions maybe in the EU even, right? But even... Um, within Germany and other countries amongst progressive parties, there are um, doubts about such a move because um, they argue that, well, if that money is not being transferred to Turkey via the EU, this would damage Syrian refugees. And uh, I think I just want to highlight that in case um, this um, uh, argument Argumentation comes, uh, you know, uh, when you encounter this argumentation, it is really important to see that uh, actually no one really cares about the situation of refugees in that regard. When we look at the past five years, how um, the issue of um, displacement and refugees has been politically instrumentalized, both by the Turkish government, but also in Europe. Uh, conceding to the very open regression, uh, authoritarian and autocratic regression in Turkey, the, one of the main concerns here was that if we have more refugees coming, our own countries will be more nationalistic and authoritarian, right? So the notion of solidarity is really here important to see that um, these um, that the preference and that the um, alliances with these marginalized groups has to go also across country borders. They can also entail that even risking uh, uh, these kind of uh, increases of nationalistic and racist discourses in European member states that nevertheless one would have to reject an agreement such as the EU-Turkey deal, for instance, which enables, gives the Turkish government and the Turkish state a lot of leverage in its policies, uh, in its autocratic uh, policies. So um, to the Western parts of the country, uh, the, the issue is um, that of refugees. And to the East, of course, we need to look as it has been addressed um, to uh, Rojava and the situation in Syria. So solidarity here really um, goes uh, uh, from uh, North to South and from East to West in that regard. Thank you for organizing uh, this panel. Um, it was quite uh, uh, productive and very vibrant and much uh, very nice also to see and touch base with colleagues. Uh, and sorry that my connection was so bad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bilgin. Uh, Dilek, please, it's your turn. Thank you. Um, I mean, uh, the 
there was a question, I think, more broadly about, you know, what, is, you know, given the case against Gergerlioğlu and now HDP, what this means for broader, for Turkey's, um, you know, democracy, future of democracy and human rights in Turkey. Um, I mean, I think there's there's really, there, there's a dilemma um, in Turkey and, and there's, an, in, in this sense too, this is also nothing new. When you look at um, the sociology in Turkey, um, there is an unchanging reality, which is actually getting worse in that the vast predominant majority of people in Turkey are um, in supportive of nationalist and or um, Islamist conservative um, ideologies and political parties. Now that is a huge challenge. In the end, I mean, at its best HDP, um, even if, you know, HDP would answer some of the criticisms made here, uh, some of which I think um, were also valid, um, you know, I guess we would agree that and would get some, you know, attract some um, from this CHP space. Um, I think the potential is really quite limited, right? So it's, it's a basic number of majority versus minority. Um, and when you have that in an authoritarian regime, you have, of course, the abuse of, um, you know, majoritarianism by the majority. Of course, CHP is key in this in terms of the opposition, um, but... Um, I, I just don't see, I don't see the signs of that um, evolving. So I guess the, what can be done by all of us and, you know, by everybody who's in that, who feels themselves in that 10, 15, whatever percent it is, um, is um, I think um, to do, I mean, again, I will now speak as a lawyer. Um, I never, you know, I'm a soci I have a socio-legal approach to law. I never fetishize this, but I think it is important to do a bit more law and to, to sort of um, not less politics necessarily, but not to so, so heavily focus on not just do politics. And in that sense, I always find as a lawyer to see so many uh, experienced um, Kurdish human rights lawyers to have left for politics. There's this revolving door. It's not even revolving, you know, they just go to politics and they stay there. And that I find really um, a pity. I understand the reasons for doing that, but sort of that then, um, you know, leads into, um, um, I mean, I think it's just important to think about this sort of, you know, sort of strategic litigation, you know, I'm not going to back to that. I'll just maybe um, close with um, responding to what Shiar said earlier, Dr. Osoy. Um, Shiar, you said, you know, we will survive this. It's, I mean, we have to aim for more than that. I mean, of course, you know, of course, HDP will survive it. I mean, the movement will survive it, it has. But given where we are after so much struggle, after all these, you know, we have to aim for more than that. I mean, it's not easy, of course, but um, it's just that it's just, you know, the sort of repetition of state repression and then more state repression. I mean, you, you know what's going to happen to the next political party. Um, and as, again, as I don't, I don't have easy um, answers for that, uh, certainly not. Um, but um, I, um, I just, um, I guess it is just important to, I mean, I think, again, it's, it, I'm not saying anything new here, but it's really important to think about the international dimension because like other authoritarian regimes, you know, change in Turkey does not come without real, real international pressure, consequential international pressure. And we need to, I don't know, we, we, maybe we need to think more collectively about that. I'd like to thank everyone, um, again, to Carol and Baki and for, for also the participants, um, some of whom also, I mean, many of them I recognize. Um, it was fantastic to have your attendance with us for so late. Thank you. Thank you, Dilek. And uh, Dinesh, please, your turn. If you could also very briefly explain the Hendek Kruzi for the record, that'd be great. Okay, go ahead. Sure. And I would like to just thank all the co-panelists for a very stimulating and interesting discussion. It was also a learning experience for me in many respects. So regarding Baki's question about the Hendek warfare, uh, I mean, in 2015, basically after the dual elections in that year, PKK changed its strategy, which mostly focused on urban warfare, which resulted in the destruction of the entire Kurdish cities, uh, and which basically lasted until 2017. And Mujahid always represents one position who is critical of the PKK strategy, but then many other people are highly critical of the state violence, uh, which obviously resulted in this uh, huge destruction. And it's also part of this, the buck, the, uh, the, the academics who signed the peace treaty, peace um, petition, which was very critical of the state approach in early 2016. And obviously many of them became subject of persecution uh, afterwards. So this is just like a bit of uh, background about that. 
So I will uh, finish only uh, say something about the Hishiyas comment about HTTP's evolving role. I think he made a very important point when he basically said that when the HTTP was established, it was established during a peace negotiations. But I just want to add something because these peace negotiations were not taking during a time of democratization. To the opposite, it was taking a time of deepening authoritarian, or authoritarian rule in Turkey, which obviously reached its pinnacle after 2018. So then the question becomes, in a sense, you were making make some negotiations with the government, which increasingly show much stronger authoritarian tendencies. It didn't work out because ultimately HDP chose a path which was not aligned with the president's his own priorities. He wanted to bring a presidential system, and maybe he was willing to give up some concessions to the Kurdish movement. But then I think clearly HDP chose the other side, and I think paid the ultimate price for that. And the second point that, and I know that some people disagree with, me, with that, HDP's role was more like mediating in the sense that you were trying to make some kind of a, establish a bridge between the insurgents and the government. But my point is that the insurgents, at least in the Turkish case, and keeping aside this Rojava and other parts of the Kurdistan, I think it basically reached a bottleneck. And from this pr perspective, HTB has no longer a role of a mediating because the government no longer needs any mediators. But I think this basically makes your task easier because then the only alternative viable path is that just trying to um, join the cross-ethnic struggle for greater democratization. And obviously I will say that other opposition actors have much more strong responsibilities, but at least from my understanding and from my perception, you have no other role because ultimately you no longer needed by the government for any kind of mediation, which is basically just uh, passed. Um, and then my final point is that, I mean, as Turkish scholars, you always tend to be maybe more pessimistic in the last five years for the very obvious reasons. But I always think from a more political science perspective is that, I mean, Turkey doesn't really have the structural circumstances for a established consolidated authoritarian rule. So, I mean, it can usually go either way very quickly. Uh, it is very contingent. It really depends on the strategies rather than basically long-term trends. And as you just uh, Hisham mentioned, uh, two years by now, that will be the centennial of the Turkish Republic. And it is very possible that we can basically have a new dawn, which is characterized by a much more promising time for not only for ourselves, but us, I think for all, all, all our children. So that will be my last comment. And again, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you all for giving three hours of your time to us. Uh, to participate at this panel. And uh, I hope uh, we'll see some of you at future panels. Uh, OTSA has received some sort of feedback from members about not paying attention too much about contemporary Turkey. So we are uh, going to be doing things like this as events emerge. Our first was on Boazici, the second now on HDP. Uh, we, we could very well do one on the move withdrawal of Turkey from the Istanbul Convention if there are people interested in putting one together. And we're also open for ideas from you uh, to let, please feel free to let us know what you would like to see here on the screen and have a wonderful week. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. attending. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.